Uh, welcome all. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, both in person, those in the room, and everybody online. Uh, we are, are, are just delighted here at the Environmental Law Program with the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, to join in uh, two partners in organizing today's hearing. Our partners are the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative, uh, and we'll hear from the Executive Director of the CPR Initiative uh, in just a moment, and also the Sierra Club of Hawaii, who's helped us to, to organize things and, and uh, get the word out about this event. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the uh, Environmental Law Program is delighted to, to share with everybody that we are celebrating our 30th year of working on sustainability issues here in Hawaii, and of course training advocates who, who, uh, who, share, who, um, who work on all, all sorts of issues from all sorts of perspectives. Uh, we, we take seriously our mandate here to, uh, to respect all, all opinions, uh, respect all information, and to create an environment in which everybody feels comfortable to share. And that's something that was instilled in us at the law school from day one uh, by Chief Justice Richardson. Uh, in particular, we make sure that our students always have an opportunity. And so today, I think we have uh, quite a few students who have signed up to testify. Go to the next slide, please. Um, two students in particular who I'd like to introduce you to will serve as hearing officers at today's hearing. Uh, in my view, they are practicing for their future roles as judges, justices, or uh, perhaps EPA administrators and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't want to hear from me. Uh, everything else from, from here on out goes to our hearing officers. They are Malia taylor Wolf and Mehana Withens. So with that, I'll hand it off and we'll get started. Thank you, Professor Wolfgrove. Go to the next slide. So yeah, just to reiterate, we welcome all perspectives on the climate crisis, its impacts in Hawaii, and the globe and federal climate action. So we're going to start off by going over some ground rules. Next slide. This is our tentative schedule for today. Um, as you can see, we do kind of anticipate this going over because this is great news, but we did get a lot of people sign up to sign up to uh, testify. Um, but that means that everyone needs to be uh, more cognizant about their time. Um, if you have pre-registered, then you only have up to eight minutes to testify. Um, and then if you registered on the day, then you will have up to three minutes. Um, but the more concise, the better, because we do want to be respectful of everyone's time and we don't want to keep you here for too long. Um, we do want to do a recess at 3 p.m. for about five minutes to give everyone a break. And then after 4 p.m., that is when we anticipate we'll have the same day registrants uh, to testify. And then lastly, after that will be the reception in the courtyard and we'll just have some light refreshments and reviews. Um, Malia will now go over a few of the ground rules for today's hearing. Okay, next slide. So these are just rules for the speakers. If you registered before, um, you will have eight minutes to speak. Mahan already went over this. All testimony will be recorded. So please speak loudly so your mic can catch your testimony and then limit like background noise if you can. Uh, speakers will be introduced. We'll introduce the, the one speaking and then the person after that. And once again, we welcome all perspectives and please be respectful. Additionally, written testimony is welcome, and you can submit it on the link, and we are going to send it to the EPA. Just some additional uh, reminders for remote testifiers. If you could please mute your microphone and turn your screens off um, until it is your turn to speak. Um, and if you have a presentation that you are planning to share, we ask that you use your uh, share screen function. We do have a Zoom manager that is monitoring the chat if you do encounter some technical issues or if you, have, if you are having a hard time hearing. Um, and also please, for those testifying on Zoom, please pay attention to the chat because that is where our timekeeper will be notifying you how much time you have remaining. Um, and for all speakers, uh, you'll get a notice of one minute remaining and then just a please stop. And if you go over that, then we will let you know. Um, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. And Malia will go ahead and introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is going to be Dan Galpern. He is the executive director 
of Climate um, Re Restoration and Protection Initiative. And we want to thank him for helping us organize this event today. Hearing officers Taylor Wolf, Ben Wittans, and esteemed Professor Walsgrove. I am Dan Galpern, founder, executive director, and general counsel of Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative. I am also the longtime legal and policy advisor to the eminent Dean of Climate Sciences, Dr. James E. Hansen, from whom you will hear later today. On behalf not only of Dr. Hansen, but also Dr. Don Bugliotti, a Kailua resident and president of the board of directors of CPR Initiative. We greatly appreciate the partnership with the University of Hawaii School of Law and its environmental program with the Sierra Club of Hawaii, and with each of you here today, in person and on Zoom. We simply cannot turn the tide without your critical, ongoing engagement. This is CPR Initiative's second in a series of hearings that aim to answer the fundamental question, what more should the United States do on climate? But allow me to be brutally clear at this outset. We should not need to be doing this, that is, organizing and sponsoring these hearings. Instead, the Environmental Protection Agency should be doing it. That is, garnering public sentiment for more far-reaching federal action and taking testimony concerning the very strong pathways grounded in the best available science that we have proposed. And to do this, especially in highly impacted communities across the nation, including those threatened by climate induced events. But to date, the agency has not taken up our stronger approach. And so it has not seen fit to hold such hearings. Accordingly, to the extent of our capacity, we are taking on that role and thus taking it to the streets. Now, as to those stronger pathways, I can note that first, on January 5, I'm sorry, January 25, 2021, just five days after the inauguration, Dr. Hansen and I wrote to then brand new President Biden, <clears throat> urging him, quote, to make full use of a powerful tool already at your disposal to accelerate the necessary decarbonization of our power, industrial, agricultural, and transportation systems. That tool, the Independent Offices Appropriations Act of 1952, enables EPA to impose a rising fee on oil, gas, and coal based on the industry's horrendous impact to our common airship, a vital natural natural resource. Precisely when can EPA impose such fees to address that problem? To quote a part of our letter, any time an administration in power is willing to do so. Characterization of the executive and, a, and agency authority, by the way, was not initially our own. Rather, we appropriated it directly from the conservative legal scholar E. Donald Elliott, who served as general counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency from 1989 to 1991. Second, in June of 2022, we filed a citizen's petition with EPA under sections 6 and 21 of the Toxic Substances Control Act, demanding the agency's construction and, imp and implementation of a binding plan to oversee an orderly phase out as necessary of oil, gas, and coal and their associated greenhouse gas emissions within reach of United States law. I filed that petition on behalf not only of Dr. Hansen and his organization, Climate Science Awareness and Solutions, but also on behalf of the also aforementioned Dr. Don Viviani, himself a 35 year veteran. EPA policymaking scientist. And also on behalf of three other experts, Richard Heady, the highly regarded climate accountability analyst, John Burks, a renowned atmospheric chemist, 
and Lisa Van Susteren, a physician and investigator of the impact on the emotional health of children in light of their knowledge of our failure to date to seriously confront the risk of dangerous climate change. And of course, on behalf of CPR Initiative. Plainly, the, to the Toxic Substances Control Act demands effective and persistent action, speci specifically upon the administrator's determination that any part or parts of the life cycle of a chemical substance presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment, then the federal EPA shall, not may, but shall impose restrictions, restrictions even to the point of prohibition upon the production, processing, distribution, and commerce, use or disposal of such substances. For how long must EPA impose those requirements? Congress and the law expressly provided the answer. It is for as long as necessary to eliminate the unreasonable risk. These authorities in combination are critically important to the existential threat of climate change, to the resolution of the existential threat of climate change, as President Biden himself has called it. Why so? Because dangerous anthropogenic interference with Earth's climate system as prohibited by the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, is a function predominantly of the production, distribution, and, and use as intended of fossil fuels. If these legal authorities, however, are now invoked and enforced as intended by Congress, then the free reign of oil, gas, and coal will come to an end. No longer will that industry be permitted to treat our common air shed as a free and open sewer for its waste. No longer, moreover, will our government stand idly by or otherwise subserve that special interest at the direct expense of the more fundamental interests of our progeny, whose legitimate and reasonable expectations for life, liberty, and happiness are now at risk of being burned to the crisp or otherwise swept away by one or other supercharged atmospheric or oceanic maelstrom. To be fair, as we must, our expert federal environmental agency has been somewhat busy during Biden's short years as president. It has, for instance, been working through a backlog to fashion restrictions on a range of other harmful chemical substances. As well, the agency has drafted at least a couple of impressively complicated rules to tamp down greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles and from the power sector. And an EPA also is assisting in the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Altogether, those efforts, in my view, amount to more than just tinkering at the margins. But in point of fact, far more needs to be done if we are to protect and restore a viable climate system or even meet the president's goals. Strangely enough, EPA at times has denied these elementary facts, but we know that the agency knows better, as does the president. If our nation is to exercise genuine leadership on climate, we must be willing actually to restrict supply and not rely merely on diffuse and expensive efforts to depress demand. We are now in a climate crisis. We are right in it. And our federal government, not least of us, needs to act like it. Not to panic, but to think. Not to fret, but to act not to placate vested interests, but to compel their reorientation. It is for our posterity that the framers devised our imperfect yet promising constitution, aiming to secure the rule of law in a democratic republic. That requires, at minimum, enforcement of existing fundamental law, 
our federal climate policy needs to subserve the interests of all of us, not some of us. Let this be a start, a start of something enduring in service to our common humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And next we're gonna have Professor Ui Tanagawa alum. And after that will be James Hansen. And then just a reminder that the speakers can introduce themselves. Mahalo nui and aloha mai kako. My name is Uilani Tanigawa Lam, and I'm an attorney and an assistant professor and the co-director of the Native Hawaiian Law Clinic here at the William S. Richardson School of Law. I hold both a bachelor's and a master's degree in Hawaiian studies from the University of Hawaii at Manu. Perhaps more importantly than those titles, I am a cultural practitioner. Hula has both grounded grounded me in this place and this culture and catalyzed my education and my career. Importantly, I am a kupa or a native of Makawao Maui, the aina or the land that raised me. On August 8th, 2023, a day after celebrating my son's third birthday, devastating wildfires tore through this land that raised me. It melted structures that are now only etched in my memories it poisoned the waters that my son will never get to experience like I did. It put at risk first responders like my nephews, my classmates, and my friends. I must acknowledge that my family was lucky because we live on the opposite end of the island, up country, and that they are safe. But on that same day, another massive brush fire threatened my childhood home. That night, there were three uncontrollable fires. Those fires burned my island home for weeks. As I sit here thinking about the impacts of climate change on our islands, I also mourn the people and places that I love and are forever changed. I am both terrified about future weather events and resolved to use the tools that I have to support our community. Issues of this magnitude are going to take everyone utilizing all of their tools to the best of their ability towards a common goal. The fires continue to reverberate across the entire Maui Island and certainly the state of Hawaii. These fires are precisely the reason why our government and the EPA in particular must act swiftly and decisively. Most important, however, it cannot accomplish this alone or narrowly it must consult and partner with marginalized peoples who suffer at a disproportionate rate from the impacts of climate change. This is not to say that these institutions must not act on its own with its resources, but it must also act expansively. In considering the climate crisis, the United States must take this approach and consider indigenous and marginalized perspectives as a part of the solution. As a scholar who examines environmental issues and solutions as sites for healing for both people and land, there are readily available pathways to explore as a means to respond to this climate crisis. Kanaka Maoli, or Native Hawaiians, like many other indigenous peoples, have specific regenerative practices that Western science is beginning to confirm what our people have known all along. These practices and these worldviews have significant environmental benefits that can directly combat the climate crisis. In fact, those practices and worldviews are embedded in our state laws. In Hawaii, our laws are unique. There are entire semesters worth of courses dedicated to this, but here's my 30 second sampler. In Hawaii, many of our laws trace its origins to Hawaiian custom and tradition. Take water, for example. For Kanaka Maoli, fresh water is a body form of one of our principal akua or gods, Kane. It is to be revered for spiritual and very practical reasons. Olai Kavai, we recognize that water is life. In 1978, Hawaii's people elevated resource protection and preservation to a constitutional mandate by adding specific provisions protecting Hawaii's natural resources and indigenous culture. 
Hawaii's courts have since reaffirmed that and held that Hawaii's water resources are held in trust and should be managed for the benefit of the present and future generations. The fires in Lahaina are a poignant example of the catastrophic and far-reaching effects of climate change. The devastation continues to have broad impacts, not only on individual humans and families that I know and love, but also uncovers larger harms and notably larger injustices. Given Hawaii's over, over reliance on tourism, for example, the economy is estimated to lose $13 million per day in revenue. These figures are being hurled at grieving and displaced families as evidence about the need to reopen to tourism, despite clear and adamant resistance. Rebuilding, which is also deeply mired in conflict about who is in control, is estimated to cost our government billions of dollars. A few weeks ago, after 12 hours of oral testimony, 300 pages of written testimony, the state body responsible for managing Hawaii's water resources heard about the decline of those resources, the uncertainty of its quality, as well as the community's resounding distrust in that governmental body and government in general. The community also directly traced and challenged the big corporations monopolizing resources as well as the public discourse. These issues and conflicts will only inten intensify. These clashes are not simply a matter of differing value systems, but rather steeped in history of conquest, of displacement, and of misuse. For Kanaka Maoli, these issues are not simply environmental issues, but rather issues of larger restorative justice. I now know that these are issues of life and death. The impacts of climate change are broad and far reaching and sometimes hard to grasp, but we must take to heart the individual stories and impacts of climate change as a call to action. My story is one of the lucky ones. And for our islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, climate change is real and it is here. This is a sobering testimony to deliver and one that does not begin to scratch the surface of the work, conflicts and heartbreak that our community is feeling here. Feelings that I know are inevitable for other families and communities across our global home, but ones that I hope will fuel this agency and our decision makers to act decisively, to act expansively in response to the climate crisis. So I thank you for holding this forum and mahalo nui for the opportunity to share my voice. Thank you, Professor Tanagawa Lung. So next we're gonna have Dr. James Hansen and after him will be James Baker. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Thanks very much for inviting me to testify. Um, I've been um, working on climate uh, theory uh, and observations for about half a century and on other planets before that. Um, global warming in the pipeline is the greatest threat that humanity faces because we live on a planet. Uh, let's see, can I advance that slides or? Okay, thanks. Uh, because we live on a planet with a climate that is characterized by delayed response and amplifying feedbacks, which is a recipe to lock in intergenerational injustice. The United Nations, the Secretary General, and national governments, based on their own statements, do not understand the policy implications. We have known for a long time that CO2 uh, is the control knob. See, I cannot advance that. So could you go to the next one? Control knob for global temperature. Based on theory and data such as these, from polar ice cores. But only in the past two years have we obtained accurate knowledge of the global average temperature change in glacial to interglacial climate change. Next chart, the last glacial maximum 
was seven degrees Celsius colder than the present Holocene interglacial period. We know the surface and atmospheric forcings that maintained the Ice Age cold. Together, these imply a climate sensitivity of 4.8 degrees Celsius for double CO2. IPCC's, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, best estimate of three degrees is excluded with more than 99% confidence. Next slide. We, we must also look at times when Earth was warmer. Atmospheric CO2 depends on its volcanic source, therefore on plate tectonics, continental drift. 56 million years ago, the Indian plate was plowing north rapidly, subducting ocean crust and spewing CO2 into the air. With high CO2, Earth was too warm for ice sheets. Sea level was 60 meters, 200 feet higher than today. Florida, Louisiana, the U.S. East Coast, and a large part of China were underwater. Next chart, we can construct global temperature history from oxygen isotopes in micro shells in ocean sediments. Maximum temperature <laughs> occurred 50 million years ago as India had a hard collision with the Eurasian plate and began to push up the Himalayas. Volcanic and metamorphic CO2 emissions then began to decline and the world began to cool. 34 million years ago, Earth had cooled to the point that Antarctica glaciated and sea level fell. Continental shelves were exposed. Most of today's large cities are located on those continental shelves. Global temperature, uh, my next chart, provides our most consistent evaluation of CO2 amount. CO2 was about 450 ppm when Antarctica glaciated. This conclusion exposes the unrealistic lethargy of ice sheet models that IPCC relies on which require at least 700 to 800 ppm of CO2 to deglaciate Antarctica. Sea level rise is a more serious threat than IPCC estimates. Next chart. With today's solar irradiance, the climate forcing required to yield Cenozoic temperature is this curve. The dashed line is the we are here line. Today's greenhouse gas forcing alone would melt Antarctica if we left that forcing in place. It takes time for the ocean to warm and ice to melt, but once melt melting gets going, it's hard to stop. Now, aerosols, small particles in the atmosphere, the next chart, reduce the human-made forcing to about three watts, which may not be enough to totally glaciate Antarctica. However, uh, there's uh, ice equivalent to 25 meters of sea level, that's 80 feet, which is in contact with the ocean. It can melt relatively fast. And greenhouse gas forcing is still increasing about half a watt per decade. Uh, next chart. And aerosols are decreasing. That's, that's good because air pollution kills several million people per year. But aerosols offset much of greenhouse gas warming. Payment uh, for that Faustian bargain is now due. Regulations to reduce sulfur in ship fuel went into effect in 2015 and were tightened in 2020. In the North Atlantic and North Pacific, where ships are the main sulfur source, absorbed solar radiation has increased 
two to three watts per square meter. Next chart. Globally, it seems that aerosol reduction has almost doubled Earth's energy imbalance. And Earth's energy imbalance is the proximate cause of global warming. So we can project, as on the next chart, with confidence, a post-2010 acceleration of global warming by at least 50%. Empirical confirmation should become clear over the next several years. The next chart, meanwhile, greenhouse gas climate forcing continues to increase rapidly, almost half a watt per decade. There's an enormous gap between reality and the scenario designed to keep warming less than two degrees Celsius. And that scenario has huge, implausible negative emissions from biomass burning power plants. That scenario is not happening, happening because the real world needs energy. And most of that energy is still coming from fossil fuels. And most of today's emissions, if I could have the next chart, and future emissions are from emerging economies. Most of today's emissions uh, are from uh, the, the developing countries. You could have the next chart. Uh, climate change is caused by and is accurately proportional to the cumulative historical emissions. The nations most responsible are the United States, the United Kingdom, and Germany. But future emissions will come mainly from emerging economies. If you have the next chart, the requirement is that we reduce the carbon intensity of energy to near zero. We reduce the carbon intensity from 0.8 to 0.7 in half a century. Anyone who says that we will reduce it to near zero in the next 27 years must be smoking something. <laughs> the only one of these countries that will do it is Sweden, which decarbonized its electricity in part by building nuclear power plants. My uh, final chart on required actions, none of which are occurring. And I have already uh, talked about the essential requirement of a rising carbon fee until I'm blue in the face. And you can read about it um, in the many places I've written. Today's uh, East-West confrontation which is an artificially generated confrontation, must be replaced by cooperation, by real cooperation, if we are to leave a healthy, beneficial climate for young people. On uh, point number three, the 1.5 degree Celsius limit is already uh, deader than a doornail. And somebody should inform the Secretary General. The two degrees uh, C limit is on its deathbed. It, it can be rescued only with the help of purposeful actions to restore Earth's energy balance. These must be done soon and must begin soon within a, within a decade or we will leave young people a situation with climate disaster that's out of their control. It's possible to do a lot in a decade. John Kennedy set the goal of going to the moon within a decade and we achieved it. 
now we are all in a boat that is sinking. We must both fix the leak and bail water. We must reduce emissions as rapidly as practical and take additional actions to restore energy balance. We must define those actions carefully over the next several years so that as the world begins to understand the situation, we will be ready for the additional action. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Okay, next to work, we're gonna have James Baker and then after is gonna be Lauren Watanabe. And just a reminder to stick within your time limits. So everyone has enough time to speak, please. All ready? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Great. I'm I'm Jim Baker. I'm an oceanographer, and I'm former Under Secretary of Commerce and Administrator of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm speaking today because I believe we're not taking enough action to deal with fossil fuel-driven climate change. There's a scientific case. There's an economic case and there's a moral case for strong action now. This is a change from the past. As Jim has pointed out, for the past 10,000 years, humans have lived on the earth in a relatively constant climate, disturbed only by the occasional hurricanes and eruptions of volcanoes like Mauna Loa. But now we know that the burning of fossil fuels is changing our climate. If we don't take stronger action, Humanity itself is at risk. How hot will it get? Well, as we've all seen, the world is getting hotter with more weather extremes. Science shows that without intervention, it could get too hot to sustain agriculture and even human life by the end of the century. What should we do? We have to address both sources and sinks. Burning fossil fuels is the major source of carbon dioxide emissions. Our goal has to be to stop those emissions in time to avoid dangerous climate change. But it's not easy to get to the global scale required. As we've seen, as Jim has pointed out, fossil fuels are cheap and widely available. They're our major source of energy today. To replace that source, we need country scale generation and worldwide deployment of green energy and we have to maintain our forests and agriculture with land use practices that absorb and store carbon on a large scale. We've seen some good progress in each of these sectors, but the progress is limited compared to the need. The recent global stock take by the United Nations shows that current and projected efforts are not nearly enough. Entrenched corporate interests massive existing infrastructure are added to a distracted society and have slowed the progress. Our current and likely future trajectory for emissions still leads to danger for humanity. Action is needed now from all sectors of society. We should drop subsidies for fossil fuels. We should cut the extraction of these fuels abandon plans for new coal, oil, and gas infrastructure, and expand EPA's authority to restrict power plant emissions. We must save and expand our mature and old growth forests and adopt climate-friendly farming and other land use practices. And to emphasize the cost of using fossil fuels, that goes to all sectors of society, we must we recognize and adopt the true social cost of carbon, which is well above that used today. The effectiveness of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act show the importance of regulation and the power of the legal system. We need ready public access to courts. We need more thoughtful government action and reform. 
we need more engagement of the public in private and public sector decisions. The sponsors of this hearing, a Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative, the University of Hawaii Law School, and the Sierra Club, have each shown how attention to regulation can directly affect emissions. The recent victory of young plaintiffs in the nation's first constitutional climate trial emphasizes this point. The judge ruled that Montana's continued development of fossil fuels violates the right to a clean and healthy environment. Finally, there's a moral case. We know the world is facing major change. We know that how much the world changes depends on what we do. Each of us should find ways to reduce and offset our emissions. This is good for the environment and it's good for future generations. Religious leaders around the world have emphasized the case for moral action. But only by working together can we, modif can we mobilize governments, private industry, and civil society to take the necessary actions. We have to recognize that solving climate change won't make the world sustainable and it won't make the world equitable. But solving climate change is a step in the right direction for preserving human life on earth. If we can do that, we can grant a few generations, who knows how many, enough time to wrestle with how to achieve an acceptable standard of living for all people on earth. There are more endangered species per square mile on these Hawaiian islands than any other place on the planet. Let's not add humans to that list. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we have Lauren Watanabe, and afterwards we'll have Tom Giambaluka. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, Aloha, everyone. I'm Lauren Bayasuros Watanabe. Um, I'm a mother, a water drinker, I'm an indigenous Chicana settler, um, as well as an uh, environmental justice advocate, um, deeply committed to supporting those who Aina this rightfully, whose this Aina rightfully belongs, and whose generational resilience and connection to this land is what preserves the sacred beauty that we get to um, appreciate about, about Hawaii. And so it's in that spirit, I really want to echo what Professor Tanagawa has shared so beautifully and laid out. Um, about Maui and about um, real climate action moving forward that, and even continuing from uh, Mr. Hansen, that must distinguish between ecological collapse as a crisis of carbon, but rather begin to address the unique historical harms of US and Western institutions that have you know, placed Oahu's finite resources, um, have compromised these resources and throughout the islands in the Pacific. Um, I'm sure many of you all know we have an unsustainable reliance on the global market, uh, tourism and food. This is seen through military occupation and threats to our current aquifer um, and ongoing issues such as um, Pearl Harbor, which is the largest natural harbor with deep cultural meaning for Kanaka Maoli, but is now filled with military vessels that have turned it into a super fun site. And we also have our prime fishing grounds polluted with PCBs and industrial waste. Um, and of course, as mentioned, Kapukaki, aka Red Hill, um, most recently showed the detrimental harm. Um, and this, especially as a mother, um, hearing so many families and, and children who were poisoned, um, whose water was poisoned. And um, this was all preventable, right? These are all because of um, an increasingly um, apparent um, issue with how we, if colonization in Hawaii, and this actually follows with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that this year formally recognized colonialism as a historical driver of climate change, but also an ongoing issue that exacerbates communities' vulnerability to it. And so as I just shared a few um, examples in our recent history, that's kind of the place we're at in Hawaii. And so I would like to use my time to really urge the um, Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. government to really um, take to heart that decolonization is a part of the global response to climate change. That is something the IPCC has. They have um, a whole 34-page summary report about um, what that could look like through a distributed justice, procedural justice lens. Um, I would like to 
um, begin to think more or urge the government to think more honestly and holistically about land back as um, it's also noted that the military occupies about 25% of Oahu's land and in a place again where um, we have finite resources and continuing land tensions with the affordable housing issues with feeding ourselves. Um, what could we done with um, if we had that create our own local food economy and so um, again with having a lot of chunks of land that have been contaminated or decimated um, through this interference because I keep saying occupation I think it would be great if the um, US government really looked at meaningful partnerships where indigenous people lead and indigenous science leads and um, the US government is already doing this on the continent there's a lot of tribal nations um, in the Bay Area they have done this kind of land back and indigenous stewardship over lands to restore and heal um, soils and waters and it's happening here um, as well, not necessarily the partnerships, but there's communities on Molokai and Kauai who have been recognized as global climate leaders for um, using Ahupua'a Native Hawaiian systems thinking to restore watersheds in these areas. And so if we can take seriously, again, this, the um, climate action as an opportunity to heal um, not only our soils and waters, but also our social fabric, which is equally needed um, I would say, and so okay, said this about that. Um, there are countless local indigenous scholars here working on the ground to embed um, this framework of um, and using indigenous science and using a holistic shift towards climate resiliency. And I just want to uplift a few of them. Um, I can start with Chip Fletcher, who has talked about and again formally recognized the need for indigenous knowledge and leadership in order to effectively mitigate and adapt to climate impacts and to best steward our resources and systems in a resilient and sustainable way. Professor Kamana Beamer has, uh, is working around the world to create models of circular economy centered upon bye bye um, to care for Aina in a regenerative, equitable, again, embedding equity and justice into how our economy can operate um, rooted in care. And lastly, Professor Kapua Sproke, who is also um, a law professor here, has her essay, An Indigenous People's Right to Environmental Self-Determination, Native Hawaiians and the Struggle Against Climate Change Devastation, which offers decision makers four realms of self-determination for Native peoples. And this is also to be noted that um, the Biden administration has recognized ancestral knowledge as key to integrating into decision making. So um, offering um, Professor Kapua Sproke's restorative justice framework that looks at cultural integrity, lands and other natural resources, social welfare and development, and self-governance. These realms are values and they're a starting point for climate action because they synthesize international human rights and supports local community level governance over our resources. Affirmative measures um, to redress the consequences of colonization and the climate crisis are the most urgent <laughs> steps forward um, that we can make. Um, and so I firmly request that the more that the EPA and the US can do on climate that we're asked to um, think about in this hearing is to move forward in this way. And I find a lot of hope amongst all the um, kind of catastrophic apocalyptic future we have in the science, um, whereby we can return to these indigenous systems, science and Aina based values that have previously protected and sustained our islands since time immemorial. immemorial. Um, so in that way, I shall close and thank you for listening to me. <laughs>
you know, there's a tendency for us to think that it might not be uh, so impactful here in Hawaii. So go to the next slide. So this is uh, from work by uh, Aurora Cagallo Viviani, who used a very clever method to analyze data and uh, produce this time series of sea level air temperature in Hawaii. And as you can see, this is a, a over a hundred years, over a hundred year period. As you can see, there's a, a very robust, very steady and steep increase in air temperature that we have already experienced here in Hawaii over the last hundred years. In fact, that 0.12 degrees Celsius is equivalent to about 0.22 degrees Fahrenheit per decade over that period, which is higher than the global average surface air temperature rate of increase, which is a bit surprising since we're in the middle of an ocean and that tends to be provide a buffering effect on temperature change. Next slide. So why should we worry about this? Well, it turns out that heat uh, events like heat waves kill more people than any other type of weather related event. It kills more people than floods, more people than hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, so this is a direct effect of global warming and it will and is already affecting us here in Hawaii. Next slide. It also has impacts on our ecosystems. This is one example in marine ecosystems of coral bleaching, which happens because of marine heat waves. Next one. And it affects our wildfire risk, which is something that we're all cognizant of and all thinking about right now after the tragedy in Maui. And it turns out that day of those fires that affected Lahaina and, and Kula was the hottest day of 2023. Uh, at that time. We've had another day that's hotter than that, one or two days that's hotter than that since, but it's no coincidence that it was the hottest day of the year because those high temperatures drive conditions that make wildfires uh, uh, more, uh, more frequent, more likely, and drives their, uh, their spread, their more rapid spread. So with the high winds that day, high temperatures, the high temperatures also tend to make the relative humidity lower. That also makes fires more likely. Next one. Okay, so what about rainfall? You know, temperature change is really important here, but changes in rainfall probably are even more important. Um, and we know from records that go back over 100 years that we have experienced decreases in rainfall, decreases in average rainfall. And this is for just the winter months, so that's our wet season. This is the time when our aquifers are replenished and when we get most of the rain that we get during the year. And you can see from about the 1970s on that there has been a decrease in average rainfall. Uh, and so that's a you know, multi-decadal trend in rainfall. But that is actually part of a longer trend in de uh, decline in winter rainfall. Next one. And this is based on a reconstruction of winter rainfall going back to about 500 years. And you can see that in the latter part of that, from about the mid to late 1800s, there's been a decline in rainfall during you know for winter rainfall in Hawaii. Next one. Next one, please. Okay, but that uh, that trend is not seen evenly around the state. Uh, so some areas are getting experiencing decreases uh, at a faster rate than others. But you can see that almost the entire state has been affected by declining rainfall. The red, yellow, orange, and red colors indicate uh, areas that have seen declines in rainfall over approximately the last 100 years. And the, you know, the darker red colors are areas that have had the fastest declines. So, those decreases in rainfall are one of the reasons we are also seeing decreases in stream flow, including stream base flow. And the base flow of streams is the amount of water that flows when it hasn't rained for a while. And that is a really good indication of the state of the groundwater which is really important for us for our, our drinking water supply and other uses of water. And you can see all of these gauges all, all across the state have experienced uh, significant declines in base flow. So that is an indication that the amount of water stored in the system is decreasing, and that's partly because of the decreases in rainfall. So, okay, what about the future? Okay, we've looked at some of the analysis of historical changes based on measurements in the past and up to the present. What about the future? The only tool we really have to, uh, 
to evaluate that in our climate models. Global climate models are run, they're getting better and better, but they're very coarse um, and too coarse really for us to use directly here in Hawaii. So we use downscaled models, and here's two examples of downscaled rainfall for the end of this century uh, for the wet season on the left and dry season on the right. Again, the yellows and oranges and reds indicate uh, projections of decreases in rainfall in the future, and the blues uh, and darker blues indicate increases. And there are two different projections by two different methods. The top row is statistical downscaling, the bottom row is called dynamical downscaling. I just call your attention to a couple features here. One is that you see decreases in both both analyses, you show, show decreases by different amounts and different patterns, but you do see uh, mainly decreases in the dry areas of the state. And that, that's important because that's where we live. And if we have less rainfall in these areas where we live, where we farm, or where we do business, we'll need more water. So that means we're gonna need more water in the future uh, and we're gonna have less falling uh, where we are. Also, the higher temperatures are gonna increase our demand for water. Higher temperatures mean faster evaporation. That increases our needs for water. So um, before I get to the last two slides, I want to say that those changes in mean rainfall don't tell the whole story. Uh, we have seen long-term decreases. That has given us uh, a much higher and steady increase in drought occurrence in the state, which also drives fire risk and causes other problems for water supply and so forth. But at the same time, we've recently experienced some really uh, shocking increases or shockingly high, uh, extreme high rainfall events. And so, for example, in 2018, April 2018, there was a, a rain event on the North Shore of Kauai in Waipa that now stands as the 24-hour record rainfall for the United States. It's 49, over 49 inches of rain in 24 hours. And so that drove devastating floods that that community is still recovering from. A, a few months later, in August of 2018, Hurricane Lane parked itself off of the uh, west side of the Big Island. And there were areas in the Big Island that we estimate received over 100 inches in four days, 100 inches of rainfall. So while we're having decreases in rainfall, on average, we can also have higher extremes that obviously create many problems. So I just want to say a few words about the importance of monitoring. We wouldn't have any of this information or make, be able to make projections if we didn't have measurements. One of the things we're doing right now is building out the Hawaii Mesonet, which is a network of 100 well-equipped telemetered uh, stations that provide real-time data uh, and will be, we hope, used for decades to come to monitor what's going on with our climate. Next one. So last slide. Uh, we also need to be able to access data. And so the Hawaii Climate Data Portal is a place to find all of the data, not only from the Hawaii Mesonet that we're currently building, but from all stations and various kinds of data products that we make from that. So I encourage you to look for that as well. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Up next, we're going to have Dawn, and then after that, we're going to hear from Oriana McCollin. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm Don Viviani. I live in Kailua, uh, board president of CPRI, uh, one of the event sponsors. In the 90s, uh, I was director of EPA's climate policy. Looking back, uh, there's a couple of things I wish. Oh, that's good. Uh, looking back, this is uh, uh, nobody wants to hear me twice. <laughs> looking back in my career uh, at, at EPA, I sure wish I had done a better job with climate policy. But the other thing that I really regret is, is that I didn't save any of the presentations that I used to give back in the 90s because I could give the same exact presentation today uh, that I did. In, in those 30 years, um, why haven't we hit this problem? Next slide, please. Um, the, answer, the answer is on the slide. Uh, greenhouse uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are on the left, 
And down at the bottom uh, are when those are when those greenhouse emissions are going to occur. Um, the the red the, the top red line represents the emissions from coal, oil, and gas that state, public, and private owners have already said they're going to extract in the future, in the, in the coming decades. And the, the governments, I'm sorry, that confused me. I have to start a little bit over here. The, the reason we're, we're in the state we're in is because governments seem to believe that, that two different realities can exist at the same time. The first reality is, is that we can extract all that oil and gas and coal that, that, that we say we're going to extract. And, and, and we'll be responsible for all the emissions that that red line produces. And yet somehow we can also get down to the, either the blue line or, or the green line, which are the emissions that we need to get to to have a safer climate. That is a, a one and a half or a two or a two degree emissions. Now, in, in the past 20 years, every graph I've ever seen that talks about what we have to do and where we're going always has A slight increase in emissions for about a year or two, and then a steady drop, a very steep drop. And, and the problem is we never have that steady drop. It doesn't make any difference uh, what year it is. We always promise to have it. We never have it. And so the real problem is we have to keep that oil and gas and, and, and in the ground. We, we, can't, we can't be using it. It reminds me of an old joke. Um, Somebody comes up to you with a gun and says, your money or your life. And you say, well, you know, take my life because I need my money for my old age. <laughs> Except it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not some guy with a gun who's asking us. It's, it's the oil, gas, and coal barons who, who say, your life or my money. And, and of course, we answer, no, no, please take my life because you're going to need your fossil resources for your old age. Now. Nobody would ever say that. But governments are acting as though that's what we would say, that we want to protect those people's resources. And we want to leave, we want to leave, we, 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 would, we would rather risk our own future than allow them to risk their investments. It's a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy, uh, it's a crazy argument. Companies and wealth funds want to protect their investment. We want to protect our kids. It, it doesn't seem like, like a very hard choice to me. One of the reasons for this is that government decision makers are politicians. They try not to irritate powerful interests. They also like to make everybody happy. So instead of fixing the actual problem, which is pulling all of these resources out of the ground and burning them and putting them up in the sky, they use incentives on fossil fuel demand. They try to tamp down incentives, but they don't put any restrictions on the supply. We have to do both. We have to, we have to encourage green energy so that there's less demand for fossil fuels, but we also have to tell all these people that they can't keep blowing this stuff out of the ground and putting it into the sky. Um, the whole idea of giving each side something is kind of crazy. I think the fossil fuel industry has had enough. They've had, they've had subsidies and, 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 and they've had cost-free pollution. Now it's time for humanity to get something. So, the other thing that governments do is they like to delay their pain. The world keeps promising drastic cuts in the future and only making marginal changes today, which results in no real, no real decrease in emissions. We can't keep kicking this can down the road because the road is ending. Next slide. If we don't keep some of the oil, gas, and, and coal on the ground, we can't stay below one and a half degrees rise or even a two degree rise. Fixing climate is sort of like swimming in the English Channel. You can't swim halfway across the English Channel. You're still going to drown. If we continue to go halfway the way we're going, the immediate effects of fires, the extreme heat, and weather may be slightly less than you know, we're going. Pretty soon, we'll be triggering the tipping points. The nature will turn up the heat. And it won't make any difference what we do. We won't have any effect on it. Next slide. These, tipping, these, these are climate tipping points. Uh, there are thresholds where a small change in temperature can lead to enormous irreversible changes in Earth's climate. They're self-sustaining, amplifying feedbacks. And in many cases, they're interconnected. And they resemble an avalanche. Um, when one thing warms, other things warm too. 
So when Arctic water warms, reflective sea ice melts. It exposes the water underneath, which gets hotter, which melts more ice, exposing more water. And as the Arctic warms, it activates the microbes that eat the permafrost that release CO2 and methane, warming it more, exposing more. So it's just a cascade of events, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. Now, um, tip, next slide. Tipping thresholds are closer than we once thought, as, as, the, as this slide demonstrates. Uh, back, back, when, back when I was uh, uh, doing, doing climate in, in, at the EPA, we thought we were somewhat safe if we kept below four or five degrees of, of warming. But, but some tipping points are, are, some tipping thresholds have already been passed. And we're going to pass a lot more just by 2030 if, if we burn all, all, that, all of those fossil reserves that, that we say we're going to burn. Um, the, the way to the way to the way to reduce the way to reduce an avalanche or not have an av avalanche is not when the rocks are coming at you. It's stabilizing the rocks before they fall, and that, that's what we have to do. So we have we have to we have to reduce emissions now, not in twenty years, not in thirty years, because by then it, it really won't make any difference. Now, next slide. EP has a chemical safety law called TOSCA. Uh, which, which uh, Dan alluded to and did a better job than I'm going to do, I promise. Uh, it orders EPA to protect us uh, in the environment from unreasonable risk. Fossil fuels and their greenhouse gases are the most unsafe chemicals we've ever inflicted on ourselves. Next slide. Um, and they threaten our future existence. Any avoidable existential risk has got to meet the Tosca legal trigger. Costco also has an eminent risk authority, allowing EPA to quickly act to regulate or ask the courts to take action. That, that, that tipping point is that avalanche is coming at us. Those, that's the eminent risk. Uh, next slide. Under Costco, EPA can do a lot of really powerful things. It can regulate supply either through fees or limits on fossil fuel use and or on emissions. It can require polluters to draw down their legacy emissions. There's no return to a stable climate until CO2 levels from past pollution is significantly reduced. It can regulate imports, and this is really powerful. It can regulate imports to make sure that they're made in compliance with Tosca rules. The US is an enormous market. Uh, we're the second biggest market in the world after the EU. China sends a lot of their higher priced goods to us. If there's, a, if, there's a, if there's a TOSCA rule that limits uh, CO2 emissions from fossil fuels or collects fees, then anybody who wants to import to us has to make sure they, they comply with that. So we would actually be able to reach down and maybe have an effect on all those, all those coal power plants in China if we use TOSCA. And the other great thing is it, it, can, make, it, can, make, uh, it can make rules immediately effective. Sometimes it takes a couple of years for a rule to get out. Um, but, but under Tosca, they can publish a rule, and, and, and the compliance is almost immediate. Um, in, in 2015, uh, me, and, me and the Center for Biological Diversity uh, petitioned EPA to regulate CO2 because of ocean acidification, ocean warming, um, uh, and deoxygenation. And EPA, EPA said, uh, no thanks, we're going to fix this through other means. Uh, well, actually, they didn't do any of that. Uh, then in 2022, um, uh, me and uh, Dr. Hansen, which you heard from before, CPR, and three other uh, scientists uh, petitioned EPA to regulate CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases under Tosca. And EPA said, uh, no thanks, we're going to take care of this problem through other means. But we looked at the other means that they're using, and it doesn't do very much at all. So uh, we're going to try to force EPA one more time to do the stay on job. And to use Tosca, and this time we're also going to cite tipping points. Um, if EPA says no thanks again, we're going to see in court. And um, take a look at what we're doing at cprclimate.org. If you like it and you agree with us, subscribe, and we'll let you know what our next move is going to be. Thank you. Mahalo, Don. So next up we have Oriana, and then after we'll hear from Chip Fletcher. Hi, I apologize. The bell just rang at a school that I'm at, and so it's a little noisy. I will try to be as loud as possible. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, aloha and mahalo for the opportunity to speak today. I will be very brief. Um, my name is Oriana McCollum. I am a second year full-time law student at UH Richardson School of Law. I was raised in the community of Kuhuku on the north end of Oahu. And I'm a mother to three boys and two dogs, a descendant of both island plantation farmers and crop farmers. But what I am not is a scientist. And I am very grateful that I have been able to hear from so many expert scientists today and through the past week on the truth of how climate change is currently impacting us and the increase in severity of, the, of these impacts that we should expect to see if necessary changes are not made. I thank you immensely for the work you've done to help explain the tragedies that we are witnessing across the planet, uh, planet. Excuse me. The reason I am so grateful for that is because as a single mother, it is my job to know how to protect my family. Um, as an active community, community member, it is my duty to know when my community is being threatened. And as a descendant from hardworking low-income families, I feel that it is my duty to make sure that the future generations have at least the same opportunities that I was blessed with without the struggle of battling having to live on a planet heating out of control. I understand the changes that I myself can make to satisfy these duties and am willing to do my part. But I know that um, individual and even joint efforts alone will have little effect on these impacts. So I am testifying today um, due to these duties uh, myself to plead with the EPA, despite them not attending this meeting, to please do your duty. Um, the power to ensure that necessary changes be implemented to prevent this planet's catastrophe has been placed in the hands of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. This, in, this name alone holds so much kuleana or responsibility. Um, but I also believe that you as human beings have the same duties as I do. I believe that you have the same duties to protect your families, your communities, and your future generations. Um, and I keep saying yours as if I'm talking to them. So I really hope that this reaches them. <laughs> um, but as, as the scientists have explained, making the choices that will keep fossil fuel companies complacent will not result in an ability for you to uphold these duties. Much of your recent actions taken and other efforts have shown that you agree with the science that is being shared here today. So I am having a very difficult time understanding what the holdup is. Um, so again, I testify today pleading that the EPA will, EPA will do their duty and utilize this power to make the necessary changes shared today because I can't do it. Um, no, nobody in this room can do it. Only they have the power to do it. And I, I really hope that um, that this work here today and the work here, uh, the work that the CPRI is doing uh, will have the necessary effects to allow me to uphold my duties um, and and have them uphold theirs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oriana. Okay, now we're gonna hear from Chip Fletcher and after will be Todd Sack. in earth science and technology and a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Hawaii is facing unavoidable, costly, and dangerous impacts from climate change that threaten our future socioeconomic viability. As an isolated and remote, remote group of islands without the capacity to easily exchange critical resources, such as freshwater, food, or medical supplies with neighboring states, Hawaii is especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Denying this reality or delaying rapid action deprives future generations of our best efforts, exposes Hawaii to extreme weather impacts, and unethically displaces the burden of solving this problem onto the shoulders of communities outside of Hawaii. Climate change is a factual reality, and the scientific community is unified in the view that it threatens our safety now and that the risk grows with each increment of global heating. In their 2022 State Climate Summary, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration stated that the, since 1950, temperatures across, across the Hawaiian Islands have risen by about two degrees Fahrenheit, with a sharp increase in warming over the last decade. Statewide, the number of hot days and the number of very warm nights are well above average, with values more than double the respective long-term averages. 
The rate of temperature increase is greatest at high elevations where our most sensitive ecosystems are located and where cloud condensation provides our only form of fresh water. The annual number of days below freezing is decreasing over time, as is the daily temperature range, largely due to nighttime warming. NOAA also states that annual rainfall has decreased throughout the island chain, particularly during recent years in the wet season. In 10 of the 15 years since 2007, wet season precipitation was below average, with four of the remaining five years being very near average. All of the 17 substantially above average wet years on the monitoring record since 1950 occurred prior to 2006. The number of consecutive dry days across the major Hawaiian islands has increased since the 1950s. An increase in drought conditions has been seen in recent years, particularly at high elevations. In 2010, more than 40% of the Hawaiian islands experienced severe, extreme, or exceptional drought conditions. Such conditions lead to a lack of use, usable water and an increased risk of fire. Stream flow has decreased. Average daily wind speeds are slowly declining. The number of trade wind days has decreased. Globally, hurricanes are larger, wetter, more intense, and shifting poleward toward the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. Sea surface temperature around Hawaii has increased. The ocean pH has lowered, and coral bleaching has increased in frequency. Sea level rise threatens our coastal communities with coastal erosion, groundwater inundation, storm drain backflow, and annual wave flooding. At high tide each day, the gravity-based drainage system of Waikiki and the primary urban core of Honolulu has essentially failed, and effective future drainage will require pumping. Indigenous communities face displacement, loss of cultural heritage, and health risks. Studies have documented significant and harmful effects on the Native Hawaiian community and the traditional and customary rights and practices. Climate change impacts on Native Hawaiians include impacts on upland forests, impacts on traditional agriculture, and impacts on coastal and nearshore waters. All of these trends are documented by scientists at the University of Hawaii, government agencies, and worldwide research groups who work in Hawaii. As we have all learned with the Lahaina wildfire, climate change acts as an accelerant to historical land use conditions that promote wildfire. Historical and modern colonialism, abandoned plantation lands now populated with invasive grasses, dry soil, drought and hot winds due to climate change all create landscapes, not just in Lahaina, but across all of Hawaii, that explode into wildfire with the smallest spark. Now I'd like to speak to the global situation. Multiple planetary emergencies threaten the stability of human communities. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, disease, and social injustice. These emergencies overlap and interact in ways that amplify negative outcomes, potentially leading to catastrophic fallout. Propelled by historical and modern imperialism, an extractive relationship with nature and population growth, we are speeding past Earth's material limits, destroying ecosystems critical to human survival and triggering potentially irreversible changes in large biophysical systems. Fundamental networks of ocean and atmospheric circulation responsible for the temperature and precipitation regimes that have driven the Holocene evolution of society have already shifted and are projected to falter. The marine world is devastated by heating, acidification, stratification, deoxygenation, overfishing, and pollution. On land, heat, fire, drought, storminess, urbanism, consumption, and agriculture drive regional water crises, deforestation and defaunation, public health emergencies, and pollution. The consequences of these multiple overlapping global crises fall disproportionately on the most vulnerable human populations, those who are least responsible. The broadening pattern of this inequity breeds displacement, disease, disillusionment, and dissatisfaction 
that ultimately erode social cohesion. Diminished trust in social institutions can lead to civil and political unrest, resulting in local to regional security crises. Without immediate action, we will enter a malignant era of global distress and suffering. To reverse these trends requires global investment in the following. Rapid decarbonization, correcting market distortions favoring fossil fuels, avoiding the spurious trap of net zero as an excuse to continue polluting the atmosphere, and proper monitoring, verification, and reporting of carbon offset contracts. Building a new era of reciprocity and kinship with nature and decou decoupling economic activity and environmental degradation. Implementing sustainable regenerative practices in all areas of natural resource economics, including especially agriculture. Eliminating environmentally harmful subsidies and restricting <coughs> trade that promotes pollution and unsustainable consumption. Accelerating human development in all SDG sectors, especially promoting reproductive health care, education, and equity for girls and women. And in low- and middle-income nations, relieving debt, providing low-cost loans, financing loss and damage, funding clean energy acceleration, arresting the dangerous loss of biodiversity, and restoring natural ecosystems. It is time for heads of state to declare a global emergency in order to immediately pivot the considerable power of the economy toward restoring a livable planet and an equitable and just socioeconomic system. In classical antiquity, baby Zeus was kept alive by an endless cornucopia or horn of plenty while hiding in a cave from his devouring father, Cronus. Humans, in similar fashion, have been kept alive by a cornucopia of earthly resources. Tragically, however, a fundamental difference separates our experience from that of the Greek gods. There's no magic guaranteeing us a just, nourishing, and healthy future, and hope will not catalyze the change we need. That work must fall upon us, and it is clear that we are past due for and critically far away from an appropriate reaction to the global emergency we have created. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, disease, and social injustice risk the stability of human communities on Earth. We must stop treating these issues as isolated emergencies and establish a systemic response based on a reciprocal kinship with nature that recognizes Earth as our lifeboat in the sea of space not our horn of plenty. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Next up, we have Todd Sack, and afterward is going to be John Fitzgerald. Um, and just a reminder to try to be concise, we're about a third way through our attendees, and it's already almost 2.30, and we want to be able to hear from everyone. OK. If Todd Sachs not here, we're going to move on to John Fitzgerald. Or what about Paul Bernstein? Is he on Zoom? I can speak if you want. Put yeah. me on. Uh, put my video on. Yes, please. Just a second. We'll get it on. Well, it seems impossible to start the video for some reason, but I can give you an oral statement if you'd like. That's perfect. Thank you. Very good. I'm John Fitzgerald, and I was uh, for 10 years Chief Counsel at Defenders of Wildlife after working in Congress for six years at the Legislative Aid and Subcommittee Council. Uh, then was a Policy Director for the Society for Conservation Biology for six years. And um, in recent years, I have been the counsel to Methane Action, which was a coordinating body of scientists developing methods of removing methane. Scientists working at the University of Cambridge, Copenhagen, Wuhan, Edinburgh, 
MIT, Stanford, and others. And the good news is that they have developed several methods of removing methane the way nature does, and in conjunction with methods at scale of removing carbon dioxide, these can be restorative, giving us win-win solutions, restoring phytoplankton, and thus restoring much of the web of life in the ocean while sequestering CO2 in a natural way. The National Academy of Sciences in 2021 asked for more research to be developed on that kind of CO2 removal in ocean-based systems, and they're now studying and we'll have a two-day workshop on methane removal from the ambient atmosphere on the October 17th and 18th workshop, which you can look up on the web and watch. So there's a great deal of hope here. We're not just talking about desperation. We're talking about helping nature do what nature does best. For example, methane was once for many, many years, most of historical human existence at about 0.76 parts per million. It's now almost two parts per million, three times the historic average. And that's developing about 30 some percent of the warming we're experiencing now. We can turn that back around. And we can also reduce the CO2 levels, um, as Jim Henson was saying a minute ago, through the application of these methods in several years to a decade or so of intensive work using ships that are already crossing the ocean retrofitted to help produce and supply iron in places where it's missing, where it used to be supplied by whales and other large sea creatures. That can kickstart the restoration of phytoplankton, zooplankton, krill, and on up the food chain. And that can sequester a great deal of CO2. And if you do it in the lower levels by providing iron the way the Sahara provides iron in the dust, you destroy methane in the process, turning it into a little bit of CO2 and water, just the way nature does with the Sahara, Sahara dust as it's blown across the mid-Atlantic. These are hopeful methods. And as I say, the National Academy of Sciences is recommending further development in these areas. So there is a great deal of hope. Now, the tools that, that Dan and Don have outlined give the federal government the power to require those major polluters to pay for a lot of this. Tosca is a powerful law since the Lautenberg Amendments. I met with Vance Hartke in 1976, the father of the original Tosca. We talked about that when I was at Indiana University Law School, and he represented Indiana. But Lautenberg improved that thing multi times over. It's a massively important tool now. And as Don also said, that leads us to the international trade. And as Chip was saying, that is a key. We can work with the EU to create tariffs, reinvest the proceeds of those tariffs in more of this work, and help the low income countries to avoid this problem and jump ahead to cleaner economies, restorative economies, and the like. And so we can create a global solution. How are we going to do that? This fall at the COP, UNFCCC, they're talking about bilateral removal programs and credit for both the developed and developing countries where we do that. We've got to get that set of regulations right. It's got to address CO2, methane, and all the greenhouse gases for which we know how to remove these things. And it's also got to say we have to go deeply in that negative, not just offsets. That's coming up this fall. The U.S. can show some leadership there by doing that and using the technologies these universities have developed and saying, this is how we can do it globally. And this is how we can get credit towards our nationally determined commitments and beyond. How else can we do that? We can then go to the other instruments of the international law. The Convention on Biological Diversity in Article 3 says, don't harm the environment of another. Article 8 says, restore degraded ecosystems. Article 14 says, if you hurt somebody else's environment, 14.2 will tell you how to pay for it based on studies to be done after 1992. Well, we had plenty of studies and the CBD can start to do that because it should not be read as preempted by UNFCCC. It's another tool of international law. And so basically I'm going to add to the record a number of things that people will find useful later on. One is a catalog of research needs developed by the scientists I mentioned, led by Renaud Director of the Montpellier, Montpellier Center in France, where they study natural resources. He's on the French FDRA, but his chart illustrates a number of these methods. That'll be in the record. A draft declaration on methane removal will be in the record. That can be adopted internationally with or without the COP's involvement, much as the methane pledge was. We have an executive order that Biden could sign on greenhouse gas removal to augment what he's already done early on in his administration. These will be on the record. And we have several 
letters, at least two major ones from experts, scientists and lawyers alike, calling for this kind of governance as well as development of the methods, because we have to make sure that these things are done properly, not overdone, not withheld and underdone, not improperly done, but done collaterally with <clears throat> international cooperation and governance. And I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and next we have Paul Bernstein and after that, Melody Aduja. And we did get a message in the chat. EPA is um, watching in. So, and they wanna thank us for our testimony. Oh. Aloha, my name is Paul Bernstein. I'm an economist. Uh, mahalo for the opportunity to testify here. Uh, I simply wanna echo Dr. Hansen's first required action of imposing a rising fee on carbon combined with returning revenues to people and a border carbon adjustment mechanism or a CBAM. Um, the scientists who've testified so far have made it quite clear that the primary direct cause of climate change is the burning of fossil fuels. So it seems if we want to get people and companies to reduce their use of fossil fuels, we need to make these fuels more expensive. And the easiest way from a regulatory standpoint is to impose a tax on these fuels that reflects the damages that these fuels cause. But simply applying a tax without any other measures is regressive. So to correct this inequity, the revenues from the tax should be returned to people in equal amounts, thereby making the policy progressive and protecting most low and middle income families from the cost increases brought about by the tax. This policy is commonly called carbon fee and dividend. But one more piece that should be added to this is given that climate change is a global problem, the government should combine the carbon fee and dividend with a border carbon adjustment, which would incentivize the US's trading partners to reduce their use of fossil fuels, which is exactly what the EU and Canada will be doing soon. So therefore, carbon fee and dividend with a border carbon adjustment mechanism should be included in the solution set of policies that the US implements to bring down US emissions to net negative. So mahalo nui for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Paul. All right, up next we have Melody Aduja. And after her will be Stephanie Violetti. Aloha, and thank you very much. My name is Melody Aduha. I am co-chair of the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. The Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii and its 77,500 members strongly support the phase out and elimination of PFAS in household products, packaging, firefighting foam, and other consumables. We need to develop a program to phase out the use of per and polyfluorocarbon substances, PFAS, in Hawaii. PFAS is a carcinogenic toxin that goes beyond our deepest understanding of what is safe drinking water. The EPA has set an interim maximum contaminant level at four parts per trillion because this is the lowest amount measurable by qualified laboratories not because of scientific evidence that show that four parts per trillion is in fact safe of PFAS to drink or consume. There is no safe amount. PFAS is known to cause cancer, immune disruption, and fertility problems. PFAS has been detected in Kunia, Waipio, Honolulu, and Kahului airports, and eight Hawaii military installation sites, including the Navy's Pearl Harbor drinking water. This poison goes beyond the general public's comprehension as to it has been used in everyday products for nearly a century. And yet we are only now learning about it thanks to Red Hill. It has been used since the 1940s in many consumer products, Teflon pans, Scotchgard, food packaging, raincoats, 
furniture, cosmetics, clothing, and even dental floss. In addition to the AFFF with PFAS used at firefighting training areas, at airports, and military installations. The recent spill of AFFF with PFAS concentrate at Adit 6 at the Red Hill facility released 1,300 gallons in November 29 of 2022. This is an unconscionable amount where four parts per trillion is the maximum contaminant level of PFAS for safe drinking water. As a visual, this MCL amount is equivalent to four drops of food coloring in 18 million gallons of water, or put in another way, four drops in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools, each holding 660,000 gallons of water. We clearly need to work together to set goals, prepare, and plan for the PFAS phase out, its cleanup and remediation, and plans for risk prevention, including filtration. This known carcinogenic carcinogen passes through our life cycle by the water we drink, the air we breathe, the fish and wildlife that we consume, wastewater we cause the reclaimed wastewater and biosolids used in agricultural produce that we eat. Furthermore, PFAS bioaccumulates as it is known as a forever chemical. It does not, it does not biodegrade for 700 to 1,000 years. It can pass from mother to fetus through her bloodstream and from mother to child through breast milk. It's multi-generational and bioaccumulative Properties compound the toxicity of the PFAS in the human body. We need to plan for PFAS phase out in man, its cleanup, remediation, and risk prevention, including water filtration. PFAS is utilized in the manufacture of food packaging, which releases greenhouse gases. The use of PFAS in food packaging causes the release of chloral defluoral methane also known as HCFC22 or R22, in connection with the manufacture of PFAS in the use for food packaging. R22 is an ozone depleting substance with a global warming potential estimated at more than 1800 times that of carbon dioxide. R22 has been phased out in the United States as of January 1st, 2020, it can no longer be produced, imported, or used. However, R22 is produced as an intermediate during the manufacture of PFAS. It is not subject to these prohibitions. As such, facilities that are manufacturing PFAS compounds are releasing significant amounts of R22 in the environment in contravention of these prohibitions. Thank you. Thank you. And next we're gonna have Stephanie Violetti and after will be Dave Molinix. No worries, hi, welcome. Hi, just go over there. Yes, yeah. please. Okay. Give me a second to get your slide up. Okay, give me the first one. I think it's that Thanks. It's been a long time since I've been in this classroom. Um, Aloha, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Nihipali Violetti, and I was born and raised and continue to live in the Ko'olauloa Moku on this island. So you can see Ko'olauloa is there in the top right hand corner. Um, it is a 26 mile stretch from one end to the other on a single lane road. The negative and ever changing impacts of climate change is evident, including increased fire, flooding, soil runoff, that is damaging our reefs, 
coastal erosion and the transition from fossil fuel to clean energy. Um, slide two, please. I live in Kahuku, surrounded by 20 windmills. <clears throat> and drive to work in Honolulu almost every day. So I'm just gonna give credit to Jenica Taylor and La Hui Foundation for the um, picture in the middle. So I appreciate the opportunity to share my lived experience as a community member and leader, a native Hawaiian social worker, a hospital CEO, energy advocate, and a mother of two. The purpose of this gathering is seeking to not only understand the science behind climate change, but also how it impacts other aspects of everyday life, cultural practices, economic activity, and environmental rights. Thus, to make it simple, I just have three takeaways. So I was actually at the UH School of Medicine the other night for a um, health and climate change um, film viewing. And I came across, there's a basalt pohaku or stone called Makabal Vortex. So it is a metaphor for gathering energy in the presence of scientific exploration. Makabalu translate literally as eight eyes, encouraging all to look with multiple perspectives, including spiritual, physical, temporal, and, vir and environmental. I liken this to the way we approach climate change. There are huge opportunities to cross pollinate with other industries, especially healthcare. Social determinants of health or upstream factors require diverse perspectives and partners to really move the needle in elevating health and wellness. There are multiple ways to make deeper impacts instead of in silos. Second would be education. How do we connect the dots to these challenges in languages? communication that people outside of environmental, energy, climate, science spaces will understand. We need more translators and bridge builders, like the Hawaii State Energy Office, the Clean, um, clean Energy Wayfinders that are um, in eight different communities throughout the state to be um, a resource for all things energy. And the third thing, I would um, ask is that we just, oh, the third, third slide, thanks. Is that we just do better. How do we flip the usual way of doing things so we put our most vulnerable people first? So I will submit my comments too, but there's a link to the Aina Aloha Economics Features, which provides a framework focused on a deep and abiding love for Hawaii's communities and natural environments. I urge you to take a look at how we can be pono, do the right thing in a balanced way. That's it, thank you. Stephanie, we have Dave Melanix. And I think after that, we'll go ahead and take a five minute break. Um, but we'll return and Mike you all. Aloha Kako. My name is uh, Dave Monix. I'm co founder of 350 Hawaii and Greenpeace Hawaii, about 5,000 members statewide. Um, we'd like to talk about. Uh, climate policy and additional U.S. federal actions. First thing we need to do is declare a climate emergency. It is essential. Um, if that's all President Biden did, that would set the tone, that would set the entire world in a certain direction to be working together as a team, just like during World War II. So, I mean, there are further things you could talk about or do with that, but that's the first essential thing to do. We can stop uh, federal approval of all new fossil fuel projects to deny the re and repeal all permits for new fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to ban fossil fuel leases and permits on public lands. We need to phase out fossil fuel drilling and production on public lands and waters. Uh, we should use a green manufacturing to drive 100% clean energy transition. Use the Defense Production Act to mobilize domestic production 
of clean energy, energy efficiency technologies, storage, smart grid infrastructure, and electric vehicles. We can fossil fuel subsidies and bailouts. It's absurd that we <laughs> that oil producers get subsidies. It's it's crazy. Hold polluters accountable. Investigate, prosecute fossil fuel polluters for damage they have caused and electric utilities for antitrust violations. Um, they're poisonous and they're getting away with it and nothing's being done about it. And when you're being poisoned, you have to stop it. And so we should be, you know, putting them in jail or you know, finding them uh, immensely. We need to uphold and strengthen bedrock environmental protection of the National Environmental Policy Act and the Clean Water Act. We need to transform all federal government operations to 100% clean energy by 2025. And direct all agencies, including federal utilities, to power their operations facilities to 100% clean energy by 2025. And we need to decarbonize, increase resiliency of the building sector, make retrofitting accessible, affordable, and building managers and homeowners. Next thing I want to talk about is we have to cut the incredibly overbloated military budget. It is killing us. I think the most brilliant man, or maybe this is the one thing that people are going to remember from Dwight Eisenhower, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies the final sense of death from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of our laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. Under the cloud of war, is humanity hang on a cross of iron? We're wasting billions and billions of dollars, trillions, on a military industrial complex where our people are suffering. 60% of every tax dollar that you give out goes to the military. The military is the number one polluter in the world and the number one user of fossil fuels. The U.S. Empire spends more on the military than makes 10 countries combined. Eight of them are our allies. The U.S. Empire is prepared to fight two World War II simultaneously, even though the U.S. Empire has had to fight even one World War II for 78 years. It's a tragedy. The U.S. has over 1,000 military bases in foreign countries, while our greatest enemy has 21, Russia, and our second greatest enemy, China, has only one. What are we afraid of? The U.S. Empire has been at war 230 years out of our 240-year history. So far, we've committed $140 billion for Biden regime's proxy war in Ukraine to weaken Russian military and economically, depose Putin, and expand the U.S. Empire. Meanwhile, Biden has only committed $3.8 million funding for Lahaina even though it's estimated $6 billion. That's less than 5%. Why is war more important than the people of the United States? Then there are things that we need to think about that are false solutions, like nuclear power. Um, it's been around 65 years all the problems of nuclear power have not been figured out by science and never will be because it's science. Uh, it's too late to tackle the problem with, with nuclear power. Um, we need to build 37 new nuclear power plants a year if we're going to reduce carbon emissions by 4%. And we can't even be able to tell. Um, nuclear power plants are dangerous. Hanover, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Zaporozhye, where the Ukrainian military were bombing it so they could create more chaos over there. Nuclear power is too expensive. If generating solar power from $36 to $44 per megawatt hour, uh, wind power is $29 to $56 per megawatt hour. Well, nuclear energy is 112 to 189 dollars per megawatt. It's obviously much more expensive, much more time consuming. 
It takes too long to build these things. It's too slow. The other thing I would talk about quickly is carbon pricing. This has been around for a while. It's been 30 years we've been talking about carbon pricing. And there's only one major bullet to prevent, or magic bullet to prevent perpetual climate chaos, and that's cutting carbon emissions. Um, carbon pricing isn't going to do it. The majority of organizations um, are opposed to it. Greenpeace, Life of the Land, 350, Earth uh, Network, Earth Justice Network, and Environmental Network. But the entities who enthusiastically support carbon pricing, American Petroleum Industry, BP Group, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, basically all your fossil fuel companies. And they support this because they, if you do a fee or a tax on them, they just pass it on to consumers. And um, consumers are going to get hit by it. So if you really want to stop the use of fossil fuels, you need to, tap, you need to find them or you need to put them in jail. Fees are not going to do it. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate having this opportunity. Thank you, Dave. Um, so it is 2.51 right now, so if everyone could return around 2.56, um, this is a good time to take a bathroom break, get some water, get up and walk around. Um, and then when we return, um, it'll be Mike Ewald. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, just a couple reminders: if you are on, if you are on Zoom, um, to turn your camera off, and if you are going to speak, then you can turn it on. Um, and just remember to be respectful and. We are already at 3 p.m., so we still have uh, about 17 people left. So if we could try and keep it as concise as possible, that would be amazing. Our next speaker is Mike Ewell, and following him will be Roxanne Lawson. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Mike Ewald. I'm the founder of Energy Justice Network and a new group called Beyond Burning that I'm now working with. And I've been working with folks um, here in Hawaii for several years now, um, including the Clean Power Task Force and Kiku and Aina, two new groups that started last year, to address some of the local issues here. And I want to start by saying that there is no silver bullet top down policy that's going to solve climate change. I've been in this for a few decades now. I've heard all the, here's how bad global warming is. We, we, a lot of us know that we're kind of preaching to the choir here, but we don't all agree on the solutions. And I've heard um, from Dan um, when we spoke a couple of days ago, some interesting theories about using the Toxic Substances Control Act to have a top-down kind of presidential order approach to how we're going to just solve everything in one big blow. And even if that politically were workable, okay, we'll get to that. Um, I wanted to suggest one thing that might be helpful is that look at the litigation currently going on around fluoride in drinking water, because there's a federal lawsuit over that under the Toxic Substances Control Act. And if they're successful in the legal theories that they're bringing forward to essentially ban fluoride in drinking water because it's, because it's a neurotoxin, then perhaps that would be helpful in the theories that you're trying to bring forward. However, there have been efforts to have top-down, like Waxman-Markey bill back in 2009 and all these other approaches where we're just gonna pass one big sweeping thing, since this climate lobby always promoting carbon taxes or they call the dividend now, as if that blunt instrument is going to be able to be passed in a way that's meaningful and gets the right kind of change in the right time frame. And I'm telling you that this change doesn't happen that way. If we want to get anything done, the first thing we need to be doing is getting more corporate money out of politics, because we're not going to see top-down change. We're going to see things, if they are top-down, like 
the Waxman Markey bill where climate scientist James Hansen was actually admitting that it does more harm than good. And yet over a billion dollars of money was poured into big environmental groups to push that, even though it was more harmful than doing nothing, which is pretty bad for if we're trying to solve things with a big climate bill. And we can say the same things for stuff like the Inflation Reduction Act, where some have argued about two thirds of the money under that policy is actually dirty energy. About 30 billion just for nuclear power, which is money that could get us off of fossil fuels far quicker than if we were trying to subsidize dirty and racist nuclear energy as if that could ever be made safe or sane to do. Now, what I found effective and what I've been a part of for three decades is working at the grassroots level and stopping harmful projects at the local level, um, sometimes at the state level. And as a movement, we've been successful at stopping hundreds of proposed coal power plants. I know because I started the nation's no new coal plants network that connected grassroots groups that succeed in stopping well over 100 coal plants over the past 15, 20 years. So similar stuff around natural gas plants, about three quarters of that wave of industrial development has been stopped one community at a time, not because NRDC was lobbying in the nation's capital and got some national bill passed, which never happened. Not that they do anything about gas anyway. It's because one community at a time, well networked, people supporting each other, stopped not just coal and gas, but biomass and waste incinerators, which don't even get talked about in these climate circles, because all the funding is focused on fossil fuels. As if the only thing that's harmful to the climate is fossil fuels, not recognizing that burning trees like they do in Kauai right now and have been trying to do for over a decade in the Big Island with Huhanua is 50% worse for the climate than coal per unit of energy. And burning trash, 65% worse. And that's what we're doing right here with the trash we throw away it gets burned in Oahu at the third biggest trash incinerator in Campbell Industrial Park, close to where most of the native Hawaiian population lives. And yet that is something that the county is committed to. And when those, those old burners shut, shut down, I was just talking to the solid waste manager for this county about an hour ago. And he says the plan, once they need to be replaced, is to build, uh, build more of them. And there's no way to get them to not be 65% worse than coal for the climate, because they don't have any kind of carbon filters that exist for this sort of thing. It makes no financial sense that they, they couldn't build them like that. So I'm a little disturbed to hear some of the other things I'm hearing in some of the presenters. I heard stuff about geoengineering, folks who want to dump iron filings into the ocean, as if that's going to solve the problem, not just be a waste dumping mechanism that harms the environment in a different way. And yeah, it, was, it just took a few minutes of Googling to find that MIT knew four years ago in a study that iron fertilization of the ocean is likely to be completely ineffective. And there are groups out there like, look it up, the ETC group, etcgroup.org, has great information on geoengineering and why these are false solutions. And so we need to get our choir here on the same page and understanding that some of these policies like carbon taxes, carbon fee and dividends, geoengineering things are false solutions, why nuclear power is a false solution, why renewable energy in Hawaii that's burning trash and trees and is classified as renewable, yet the Clean Tower Task Force we've been meeting with weekly for the past year trying to get your legislators in this state to stop counting that as renewable energy, and they won't because you have politicians who are in bed with these industries. We need to turn that around, and we're gonna turn that around a lot faster when those of you in this room are working together with us, but also when we focus on our local governments, on our state governments, because that's where people power is. We're gonna move them a lot quicker than we're gonna move the Biden administration or any other national level politics or international level. Even. So Melody has some science sheets she's passing around. I highly encourage you to sign up on that because that's one way those of us here can get connected with each other. There are two more talks I'm doing on this island before I jump to a couple other islands and run around and speak at other places. Um, one of them is just three blocks from here on Monday evening from six to eight. And I'd love to be able to invite you all to it and give you the details on that so you can come and can get you other materials. You can go on Zoom and watch it if you can't go in person. So if you sign up on that sign sheet Melody has, um, we can connect and get you information on that so we can work together on the most effective solution. Thank you, Mike. Next up, we have Roxanne Lawson.
Aloha Kako. I'm Roxanne Lawson, who's raised in Hawaii, mother of five. And um, I wanted to talk to you. I lived on the Big Island for many years. And Huhanua, that's where they want to have an incinerator where they burn the trees, trees that were grown on prime ag agricultural land after the cane industry pulled out. We were told it would be used to make paper. There was concern that paper might be outdated. We were told it would be used as square footage, four feet. So, Huhanua has come up with this idea, which you're probably all well aware, to burn trees. And after the seven years of burning, then they'll continue on with burning trash. And if there's not enough trash, we get to pay a fee. So, um, their goal is to operate an incinerator on the Hamakua coast using eucalyptus trees. After, okay, I already, I already read that. Science has proven that trees are the lungs of the earth. They filter out the pollutants and heavy metals. And to burn these trees is far more toxic than fossil fuels or coal. Not to say that those are good. <laughs> um, so burning trash releases toxin into the environment and further exacerbating, exacerbating an already vulnerable environment. Kakuna Aina pre presents environmental educational speakers to educate the public about what's going on. All too often, instead of, instead of the scientific method, what's utilized is the profit method. Um, there's a lot of talk about clean energy. Let's look at that and determine what clean energy is not just some money-making scheme on the Big Island or elsewhere. Um, at Kakuana Aina, we aim through science to educate the public as to what clean energy is and how the average citizen can do their part to protect our environment. I speak to you as a mother and as a concerned citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Up next, we have Mayana Dellinger, and to follow is Todd Fernandez. Hello, everyone. I trust that you could hear me. My name is Dr. Mayana Dellinger. I've had the pleasure of visiting the islands uh, more than 15 times, mainly the Lahaina area. Uh, so <laughs> we're we'll with everyone in the area. My, uh, so uh, I'm a part-time judge and a part-time law professor. I'm the full-time director of something called the Einstrong Foundation, a new foundation where we support uh, various things that would help uh, against climate change, such as, uh, for instance, a carbon taxation in adequate amounts, of course, such as that which has been the case in Scandinavian nations for years. And I hear what people saying here today that uh, there's, you know, this or that may not help. I think, and we believe in the foundation, that this is one of many attack angles. There is no one silver bullet and maybe unfortunately no one pe uh, perfect solution anymore. So uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act was just introduced again this past week, uh, similar to a car uh, National uh, Carbon Taxation Act. The problem I recognize is that that is only in the amount of about a tax of about 15 or $12 rather per metric ton of CO2 equivalent, woefully, uh, a woefully low amount in the Scandinavian nations. It's around 10 times that. We also support at the Foundation International Loss and Damage Provisions on nations helping other nations out. Uh, our private donor is very frustrated, as I think we all are, with all these uh, this lack of action. So we're also looking at private level action. Uh, so wealthy corporations and wealthy individuals being able to uh, don donate directly to needy people ar and around the world with some conditions on the donations, of course, so that hopefully behavioral change will happen from the bottom up, as well as we need it from the top down, of course. Um, 
So we're trying our best. And again, uh, we think attacks need to be happen or need to come about from many angles. Lots of, as we call it, behavioral plasticity is needed, new thinking. Uh, at both the private level, what we could do as individuals, but certainly also what policymakers, law and policymakers, and large corporations and large uh, wealthy individuals can do to help out everyone here, including the Hawaiian Islands. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dellinger. Up next, we have Todd Fernandez and then Ruth Robinson to follow. Hi there, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Yes. It says it's good. We see you. Can we make him comments? Here we go. Great. Can everyone see that? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Todd Fernandez. I'm with Climate Crisis Policy and the Earth Bill Network. I was former Massachusetts governor's ombudsman and legislative director, and I led the effort uh, to get the Equality Act filed, which is the gay civil rights bill that has now passed the House twice. Um, I now lead a grassroots volunteer nationwide network that has introduced and plans to pass the Earth Bill, a 2030 moonshot for Earth. The Earth Bill, HR 598, is formally known as the Earth Act to Stop Climate Pollution by 2030. It's a plan to stop climate pollution, to unify the movement and the public, and to make Congress act. This is the how we get off of fossil fuels. The Earth Bill mandates 100% by 2030, three things, renewable electricity by utility companies nationwide, zero emission vehicles by all car manufacturers, and regenerative agriculture by big ag, which is defined as publicly traded agriculture corporations. These are three uh, consumer items, electricity, cars, and food, three kitchen table issues. It's our money, it's our pollution, it's our right and our duty to make Congress act. There are already 10 great co-sponsors for the bill from five different um, states. I won't read them all off, but Adriano Espaillat, who is also from the Dominican Republic, an island in the crosshairs of this crisis, and also from New York, um, today, we have flooding all over New York City and the subway and everything from torrential downpours. Um, and then several other great co-sponsors, including Raul Gurhava, who was the minority leader for the House Natural Resources Committee. The real important piece of this bill is that it is uh, sort of guaranteed to reduce reductions. Um, and this is the only bill to meet the Paris Accord goals and to domesticate that treaty. Experts from uh, Regen Intel, formerly with Project Drawdown, uh, determined that the bill would reduce U.S. emissions by an additional 40% by 2030, an additional 50% by 2050, on top of the 21% now in the can or in motion. Um, this is over 60% by 2030. Again, the only bill to meet the Paris Accord goals. How it works in 15 short pages. It stops pollution at the factory, at the utility buying renewables, the car manufacturer, and big ag. It requires an industry-led smooth seven-year transition. It requires that those industries submit plans with one year to various secretariats. And then the mandates unleash private investment to build at scale and on time. All the plans go to the government and then it's an all of society push to implement the bill. These transitions are already in motion. There are renewable standards in 30 states. They're not fast enough. Um, and Ford Motors in England has a 2030 deadline to end combustion engines. And the government has just started talking about moving that deadline to 2035. And they're up in arms saying, no, we've already invested to meet the 2030 deadline. When you have mandates in law, the industry will respond. Um, regenerative agriculture is already better. Same yields, cheaper for farmers, less water. These are all positive impacts. This just speeds it up with mandates in law. The strategy to pass the bill requires unifying a movement around a flagship bill for everyone. So we're working with the big greens, but there's a lot of work to do there to convince them. The climate action campaign and people versus fossil fuel need to hear from you. Civil society, we need academia and business to join. We need public mobilization with celebrity leadership. The public already supports these goals, 70% in favor, particularly of regulating carbon pollution at the factory, 
Um, we're very focused on a two-party uh, campaign because you have a two-party government, you need a two-party push. And we're working in Republican uh, districts right now to get support. Um, this, very, this bill very clearly delineates between the consumers and the voters on one side and the mega corporations on the other, drawing a very bright line. There are no consumer price increases. The changes happened in at the factory. They are um, implemented over time. So everyone will see and hopefully it'll be a smooth end result. That's a very simple and clean bill to understand, which was not easy. <laughs> and um, I agree with the problem with fossil fuels not proven to reduce emissions. It could really make the voters mad before we have any um, clear man reduction in emissions. So importantly, this is a political litmus test. We have to elect a more pro-planet Congress. We need to know their position on policy. This bill makes a clear choice. Are you for the pollution or are you for the planet and people? Um, this crisis also presents the Achilles heel of big oil and big ag. So if we unify and push, and I think this crisis has enough people concerned, enough anxiety, enough momentum that we could push through their grasp on Congress and, and implement laws for the public welfare. And in doing so, we really retake our democracy to being one for the people and by the people. No other bill caused this Congress this question, and this is how we change the political status quo, which is really the obstacle. Um, we have a great network already. It's all volunteer grassroots. I do it for free. 800 activists nationwide, over 130 groups, many faith. The Dalto C movement just endorsed, which is the Pope's group, and Earth Day is on board and many others. And importantly, groups are taking the bill and running with it on their own, doing their own letter writing campaigns, their own petitions. And that's what it's designed for because you could never centrally organize this. It has to be something that, a tool that everyone can use. So the goal is independent action. Here's some of the groups. The next steps are to get more co-sponsors and we need your help going after the co representatives in Hawaii. We organize by congressional districts, so we would love teams there doing that. Please get more groups and leaders to endorse, including everyone on this uh, website, on this event. Um, we're working now to get a Senate version filed and we're in talks with NRDC and League of Conservation voters who have finally come around to the idea of a flagship bill and how it would be powerful as an organizing tool if we all united behind a common demand. But please continue to reach out to the Sierra Club, League of Conservations and all the others, uh, Center for Biological Diversity to get them on board. And then please visit our website, earthbill.org for more information. In summary, this is consensus solutions. These are industry mandates, which is the only bill to ever propose that on a nationwide level. Um, it's real emission reductions because they are mandates and they're scientifically analyzed. It's a political litmus test to change the political status quo. It's designed to unify the movement and the public, and it calls the question on Congress. We know time has run out. I won't reiterate. We know 2030 is the deadline. The destruction has already begun. Time is up. The Earth Bill, we believe, is the solution to save us all. It's HR 598, www.earthbill.org. And we welcome everyone to the organizing. We have regular meetings, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that was under eight. <laughs> yes, you did great on time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Todd. Up next, we have Ruth Robinson and then Ingrid Peterson to follow. Thank you. My name is Ruth Robison, and I'm speaking today from Hilo as the president of the United Nations Association USA, our Hawaii Island chapter. Uh, the United Nations Association supports the work of the United Nations. And I would like to thank you for the work of the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative and for focusing attention on the urgent need for solutions to the climate crisis by holding this public hearing today. The United States, like many other nations, made significant promises at the last United Nations COP meeting on climate change. While well, commendable steps have been taken, mm, 
It is evident that more must be done to fulfill these commitments and combat the climate, climate crisis effectively. Uh, Dr. James Hansen certainly made us aware with his scary uh, statistical charts. First, the United States must adopt ambitious and concrete emission reduction targets. Our previous targets, while important, fall short of what is required to limit global warming uh, as necessary and as, uh, as outlined in the Paris Agreement or modified by the recent science, which is abundantly uh, on tap here today. To fulfill our promises, the U.S. should um, set targets that are appropriate with, with interim goals to ensure steady progress. This would require a transition to renewable energy sources, electrification of transportation, and rethinking industrial processes to reduce carbon emissions. Furthermore, investment in renewable energy infrastructure is paramount. The transition to a low carbon economy necessitates massive investments in solar, wind, and hydroelectric power, among other sustainable sources. By bolstering research and development in green technologies, incentivizing private sector investments, and upgrading our energy grid, the U.S. will not only fulfill its commitments, but also create millions of clean energy jobs and stimulate economic growth. It is equally crucial to add address environmental justice and equity concerns. This can be achieved through targeted policies, community engagement, and robust regulatory frameworks. A sidebar here, uh, I do feel that when uh, people are saying, use our solution, no, use our solution, that really uh, it's more, uh, in, in the way that uh, Dr. Dellinger suggested, we need uh, whatever solutions we can get our hands on. Um, international cooperation is vital in the fight against climate change. The United States should actively engage with other nations to share knowledge, resources, and best, best practices. This includes supporting global initiatives to curb deforestation, protect biodiversity, and promote sustainable agriculture. By fostering international partnerships, we can collectively address climate challenges on a global scale. Unfortunately, enhancing climate resilience is also essential. The U.S. must invest in infrastructure that can withstand the increasing frequency and severity of climate-related disasters. Education and public awareness campaigns also play a pivotal role in climate action, informing the public about sustainable practices and encouraging eco-friendly choices can drive individual and community level action. A key aspect of fulfilling our climate promises involves regulatory reform. The government should enact policies that encourage sustainability across all sectors, from agriculture to transportation. This should involve introducing carbon fee and dividend with border adjustments, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, and implementing stricter emission standards. Regulatory bodies such as the EPA must also ensure that businesses adhere to the environmental regulations and promote eco-friendly practices. To conclude, the United States made important commitments at the last UN meeting on climate change. To fulfill these promises, we must set ambitious emission reduction targets, invest in renewable energy infrastructure, address environmental justice concerns, engage in international cooperation, enhance climate resilience, prioritize education and public awareness, and enact meaningful regulatory reform. By taking these steps, the U.S. can lead by example and make a significant contribution to the global effort to combat climate change. Our future and the future of generations to come depend on it. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruth. Up next, we have Ingrid Peterson and then Milan Malesh to follow. First, I want to say mahalo to everyone for your uh, knowledge, wisdom, and passion. Um, I want to add one comment about nuclear energy, adding to the discussion three days ago. Um, like my high energy physicist father, I'm very leery about nuclear energy. I Perhaps we're so desperate that we need to use it as a transition, but I want to add um, and, and for all the reasons David mentioned, I want to add um, three days ago, the moderator was saying that people got sick at Chernobyl. They didn't just get sick, they died. My good friend um, helped set up an orphanage for the children of those who died. Um, she was American, but she was working with Gorbachev during the time of Glad Glasnost, Gladnost, whatever you say, how you call it perestroika and whatever. Anyway, and, and the radiation cloud was blowing over Europe, I remember from friends and relatives who were there. Anyway, my main message though, is to attest to the, just as a lay person, to the radical changes that have happened to our climate here in Hawaii, um, just observing as a lay person. I'm 68 and a half years old. I moved here in 1963 when I was eight years old. And um, it's just that our climate has changed radically and it's very scary. I first noticed um, in the mid eighties, I was talking to my good friend who was the head of the Nature Conservancy. And I was saying, Calvin, it's really getting hotter. And I was showing him some data showing that. And, and um, just as a, uh, so the day-to-day -day observation, it used to be that 88 degrees was a highly, highly unusual heat wave growing up here in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And, and now it's, it's just a common occurrence in the summers. Um, growing up, I went to Punho School on scholarship. We only used air conditioning to keep the musical instruments and the computer room cold. Back then, people in Hawaii used very little air conditioning. We could depend on our trade winds. This has all changed. Um, I mean, I know you all know this scientifically, but I'm just trying to express it from the perspective of a, a resident. I was living on the mainland for 25 years. I used to, it came back four years ago, and one of my misgivings about coming back home was that it was just going to be too damn hot. Um, and about sea level rise, all you have to do is drive out to the North Shore and go through Haula and see how the ocean is lapping at the road and often damaging the pipes. Anyway, I thank you all for all your ideas and for all your work because um, I don't just care about Hawaii, of, of course, I care about the whole world. And um, I've been and environmentalists since the first Earth Day in 1970 when I was in ninth grade. And I don't know why we didn't make more progress because back then, of course, there was debate about whether the world was going to cool or heat. And my um, very knowledgeable son tells me, well, there is a certain cooling effect from what's in the atmosphere, but the heating effect much overrides it. But we've known the earth is in great danger, at least since 1970. And how are we passing on this horrible tragedy to our children and grandchildren? It just, it's just horrendous. Um, thank you all for your work. And um, I'm Pal. <laughs> thank you, Ingrid. Up next, we have Milan Malish and then David Walker to follow. Uh, well, uh... Hello to everybody. Uh, I'm uh, calling. I'm connecting from Europe, from Slovenia, actually. Uh, so uh, I'm not top scientist. I'm just an engineer in pension. But uh, I work uh, already 20 years uh, on some environmental problems. And I'm an author of a book uh, which describes uh, climate uh, problem and which I want to expose here. And this problem uh, is uh, are the emissions of the methane gas uh, from the Arctic territories. Uh, this problem is ignored by all governments uh, and by United Nations, IPCC, 
and most uh, unfortunately uh, by most of the Western skies too. Well, uh, from uh, mostly from the uh, Arctic East Siberian seas, leak in form of bubbling uh, already uh, huge quantities of the methane gas. And the cause is melting of the permafrost in the seafloor. Uh, also in the seafloor exists the frozen layers uh, and these layers are melting now. Then this bubbling comes from deep uh, ancient uh, stocks, from old stocks which have been created uh, in million years uh, ago. Uh, and this comes from below of the permafrost layers. Uh, while the IPCC and uh, many scientists uh, uh, admit only small uh, Arctic uh, methane emissions, and uh, this only as the result of the composition of the organic material, which is contained inside uh, of this slowly melted permafrost. But uh, the Russian scientists had measured already from 2016 forward uh, many times the fluxes of methane bubbles of around uh, one kilogram uh, of methane through the surface of one square meter, and this in one day. Uh, also more and larger uh, quantities too. Uh, so the methane from the permafrost itself can never reach so big uh, amounts and so big quanti uh, quantities. And it also can never produce bubbles. So uh, it could be very uh, clearly distinguished the sources uh, of these this, uh, big methane emissions. Now, the second uh, source is uh, the compositions of the methane hydrates uh, in the sediments uh, themselves. Uh, that is some lower lower than the, the this impermeable, impermeable uh, layer of the of the permafrost the hydrates hydrates are a mixture of the ice and uh, methane and they need they need actually very uh, big pressure outside pressure to keep to keep them together now uh, when this methane is leaking out this pressure in the sediment is falling, is diminishing, and therefore the, also the hydrates begin to decompose and uh, leak, uh, release their own methane. Uh, the biggest problem what is happening is that this deep gas which, is come, come, which comes up uh, is uh, warm. It, it, in, uh, let's say uh, kilometer uh, deep, uh, it has temperature 100 or 200 degrees and some of this uh, energy is lost uh, during the, the, the traveling, but it brings a uh, uh, certain amount of energy and this energy helps now to melt permafrost from the bottom side, you understand? And uh, the Russia scientists have recorded uh, the uh, moving of the margin where the free where uh, the free gas is coming uh, up uh, in the speeds per year, even five or ten meters. For, uh, with this speed, the 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 uh, permafrost is melting from the bottom and it means that the entire layer of permafrost could be melted in a decade, in 10 years or uh, such such time. Uh, so uh, this is the weakest and the most dangerous positive feedback for amplification of the uh, earth atmospheric greenhouse. It will, it will mean that uh, the entire frozen layer, it can disappear in a period of a decade or even faster. Now, we must also consider the surface where, where this happened. 
uh, also six, seven years ago, the Russian, the Russian scientists uh, estimated uh, the surface of so much damaged uh, seafloor. Uh, they said that that is about 10%, 10 of the entire uh, surface of East Siberian seas. Altogether, that means about uh, six, 60,000 square kilometers. And if you multiply now this, uh, this, esti this measured uh, uh, quantity of uh, one kilogram per square meter with this uh, uh, surface and also uh, with uh, uh, one year, <laughs> we get uh, a very big uh, uh, annual emission and it uh, counts then uh, about 20 billion tons of the methane any every year in the in the in the atmosphere so uh, this can be such a quantity that uh, uh, every other our effort to uh, to re re uh, reduce emissions of the carbon dioxide or the, or human uh, methane emissions uh, are almost senseless. Uh, then we must uh, also uh, take into the account the real, the real uh, uh, power of the greenhouse power of the methane. It is not like the IPCC has uh, uh, explained uh, many, many years that this is uh, average of 100 years uh, 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 decomposition of the, of the, of the methane uh, was about uh, 30 times stronger than carbon dioxide, but really we must take uh, only very short uh, time. Uh, uh, this parameter, this parameter is named global warming, warming potential and uh, short time uh, uh, value for methane, it means about 150. That, mean, that is because the methane is uh, all the time only rising in the atmosphere. It is not, it is not falling, uh, it decomposes, but uh, more than decomposition uh, comes new methane into, into the atmosphere. Uh, so, uh, and now, if we multiply now with this uh, with this uh, uh, hundred feet parameter, yes. I'm sorry, you just went over your time, and we do want to give an opportunity for other people to speak. Do you mind just summing up your thought? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I will finish. Yeah. Uh, we, we get we get uh, uh, calculation uh, where because of the Arctic uh, methane emission the uh, effect of the entire entire uh, 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 atmosphere greenhouse will increase 10 times uh, 10 times and that means certainly certainly uh, any life on the earth anymore if we live that this if we live that this gas is escaping further and many years into into the atmosphere now there are also, uh, already proposed solution have been uh, made uh, in the past, and there are also uh, some new, uh, which we also uh, was uh, deliberating about this. And one is uh, one is uh, using this gas instead today's fossil fuels. Uh, it means that we will have to cover big surfaces with some kind of roofs and. Uh, in the second phase, we would have to create some kind of artificial permafrost. That is, uh, that is uh, um, on. urgent if we want to keep safe the earth. So the, poli the politics, we have already also this view. In uh, two, year, two years ago, we have uh, uh, noted the national and institutional leaders of the of the uh, all over the world to be informed and appealed to work toward these solutions 
uh, and unluckily the response was almost zero. So uh, that is the information about a very critical process on the earth, which should the, the government uh, take very seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Milan. Up next, we have uh, David Walker, and then Joe James will follow. Hello, um, I'm going to share screen if possible. Let me know once it comes up. We can see it. Awesome. Hi, I'm David Walker, a recent graduate uh, with a degree in integrated energy management and notably today a, a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, the island chapter, the Hawaii island chapter. I'm here to speak on our position regarding national carbon pollution pricing and our appreciation for CPR's petition and action towards the EPA. Uh, briefly, I wanted to talk about who we are. The CCL exists to, to create the political will for climate solutions. Our main focus is on lobbying Congress for climate solutions in four broad areas that will benefit for, for, from national legislation. What we lobby for, so currently we're focusing on carbon pollution pricing, healthy forests, buildings, electrification and efficiency, clean energy permitting reform. Our primary focus is on carbon pollution pricing. This is the flagship element of CCL's policy agenda, usually referred to as a carbon fee and dividend or carbon cashback. This is CCL's best answer to the question, what more must the United States do on climate? Uh, if you would like to learn more about it, you can go to the URL at the bottom, cclusa.org. We wanted to talk about some supporters of carbon fee and the dividends. So recently, uh, this year, the Hawaii State House stated in part, which passed House Resolution HR 125, urging Congress to adopt national carbon fee and dividend legislation. This can be assessed at capitalhawaii.gov and capital.hawaii.gov and search HR 125. HR 125 stated, whereas carbon fee and dividend is supported by more than 3,600 economists, is a carbon tax offers the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions and all the revenue should be returned directly to American citizens. Nationally, in California, the California State Legislature in 2014 passed Assembly Joint Resolution Number 43, urged the United States con Congress to enact a tax on carbon-based fossil fuels and resolved that all tax revenue should be returned to middle and low-income Americans. Most recently, at the County Council of Maui, Resolution Number 20 to 23 passed unanimously. Uh, March 13th, 2020, and it states in part, whereas Hawaii's Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission strongly recommends that lawmakers enact carbon pricing, declaring that a price on carbon is the most effective single action that will achieve in Hawaii's ambi ambitious and necessary emissions reduction goals. Whereas many direct climate change impacts are anticipated for the Hawaiian islands, including increases in ocean and air temperatures, sea level rise, droughts, severe weather patterns, ocean acidification, and the secondary impacts of increased risks of wildfires now, therefore, be it resolved by the county by the Council of the County of Maui that it supports the 2020 legislation to enact the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act and that it urges the 116th Congress, Congress to pass HR 763 and create a carbon dividend trust fund for the American people to confront the climate emergency. In addition to legislative support, CCL's webpage lists prominent individuals and private organizations that are formal EIA supporters. One of these supporters is Dr. James Hansen, who has actually already spoken today. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, we wanted to showcase some of his works that we found applicable. In his book, Storms of My Grandchildren, he says, 
We must rally, especially young people, to put pressure on our government. The most essential actions are, first, a significant and continually rising price on carbon emissions as the underpinning for a transformation to eventual carbon-free global energy systems with collected revenues returned to the public so they have the resources to change their lifestyles accordingly. This is the most important requirement for moving the world to the clean energy future beyond fossil fuels, but a carbon price alone is inadequate. Later, he wrote a white paper in response to a congressional request for information from United States House of Representatives Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. The fee and dividend policy will reduce emissions faster than other carbon pricing policy options. CCL is open to supporting climate pollution pricing policies if they provide meaningful emissions reductions support households, provide a level playing field with other countries, and are politically viable in the near term. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we appreciate CPR's initiative on climate policy reform and necessary EPA action. Uh, we would really like to review the petition and see it distributed to the public in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, David. Up next, we have Joe James and then Ellen Goldsmith. Hello. Might I share my screen? Yeah, yes. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, here it's evening. I'm calling you and speaking with you from Columbia, South Carolina. So it's almost uh, 9.30, 10 p.m. here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a solution that might have helped to prevent the fire that uh, attacked Hawaii. And unfortunately, the conditions that caused the fire uh, are still prevalent there. Um, Climate change is the world's greatest existential threat, but if handled well, it presents one of the world's greatest environmental, economic, uh, and societal opportunities. Using our patented CRBBP process, we do good things for the health and well-being of the planet and its people, including preventing and mitigating the spread of wildfires. I'd like to talk to you about how that application might apply to Hawaii. Uh, I'm a former 33-year economic development professional. I won a Purpose Prize in 2008, and I'm a 2022 Meta Environmental Justice Awardee for my work using innovative concepts to protect and uplift poor rural and urban communities of color. I served a six-year term as a secretarial appointee on the Federal Biomass Research and Development Technical Advisory Committee. I invented and patented the CRBBP process, which I'll tell you some more about. And I've uh, invented and licensed innovative biomass carbonization and utilization processes. So my combined remediation biomass and bioproduct production process, that's why we call it CRBBP, because that's quite a mouthful. Using that process, we plant and then we multitask very special bio crops that grow very quickly and very large that can less expensively capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and simultaneously perform other environmental services, including remediating contaminated air, soil, and water. We then harvest those crops and convert the resulting material or biomass, which contains the captured carbon, into a variety of cost advantage bio products including some which are circular economy and will never end up as waste. Our preferred crop is something called biomass sorghum. We like it because it grows fast and big in six months. And by the way, it's not invasive. It has to be uh, planted every year, but it captures seven tons of carbon dioxide per acre above ground. And in its root system, it captures another ton of CO2 per acre. On the left is standard sorghum, 
And uh, I didn't change the height of the gentleman pictured here. They're both about the same height. But you can see that standard sorghum at its six month maturity comes to the waist of the gentleman in the picture on the left. And biomass sorghum, which was bred to make cellulosic ethanol. In other words, it was bred to maximize the amount of cellulose per acre. Uh, that's what it looks like at its six month maturity. It grows fast and big and produces tremendous amounts of plant material per acre. And if you know anything about photosynthesis, uh, plants grow by capturing CO2 and in the presence of sunlight, nutrients and water, convert that into cellulose or plant material. We asked the University of California at Berkeley to do an analysis that would compare biomass sorghum to switchgrass, which is a perennial biocrop, and to an equal acreage of pine trees over a 15 year period. Biomass sorghum captures nearly four times the uh, carbon dioxide per acre as an equal acreage of trees and twice as much as switchgrass. So we are now using this crop as a way of putting idle or underutilized land to work. Uh, and our first target has been utilities. Uh, and we are planting these crops on their sites to help them reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, we've conducted demo projects or are partnering uh, with utilities to conduct demo projects in Maryland, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And in that process, we will help them select sites, plant the biomass sorghum, capture significant amounts of CO2, and then convert, convert the resulting biomass into biochar, which is a carbonization process that can permanently sequester the captured carbon in the soil, uh, not only generate carbon credits, but provide other benefits uh, to the utilities as well. That's a concept that we would like to deploy to prevent and mitigate the spread and severity of fires, wildfires in particular. If I understand correctly, the wildfires in, in Hawaii were caused by uh, uh, weeds and other plants that were growing wild on former land, upland uh, from the city that had been uh, sugarcane plantations. Uh, it would be our uh, suggestion that we plant our bio crops on those soils, use them to capture CO2, and then we can harvest those crops at the time of the year when it's uh, more likely for a fire to start and remove that fuel from the environment, convert the plant material into biochar and sequester the captured carbon in those soils. We would love to collaborate with Hawaii's universities, with governmental agencies that are working on climate change mitigation and others uh, to demonstrate how this process might work in Hawaii. Again, climate change is the world's greatest existential threat, but if handled well, it presents one of the world's greatest environmental, economic, and societal opportunities. And by the way, the making of bioproducts from the plant material that we generate is a way of creating new bioeconomy jobs. So using our patented CRBBP process, we do good things for the health and well-being of the planet and its people including preventing and mitigating the spread of wildfires. So I look forward to uh, hearing from those of you in Hawaii that are interested in collaborating with us to uh, put together demonstration projects showing how we might be able to use our process to protect Hawaiians. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, presenting, uh, to present to you today. And I look forward to uh, collaborating with you and, and hope that uh, you'll get back to me if I can be of any assistance. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being um, sticking around and we know that it's late where you are. Um, up next, we have Alung Guol and then Sophie Tidler will follow. Um, and that was the last of our online speakers. So just a reminder for people in person to just make sure to speak loudly so that the speaker can pick up on it. Okay. Um, Jabba Jabba Amapula, the Alanga Gadangilan, 
Aloha mai kaku. My name is Ellen Gazangilan. I'm indigenous people from uh, Taiwan. I belong to Taiwan Nation. My community is situated in Southern Taiwan called Julukuan. I'm an LM student in William Richardson Law School. I submit this test testimony on behalf of Lima, Taiwan Indigenous Youth Working Group. Lima means five or hand in Austronesian languages. The reason we name after Lima is because we trust that working hand in hand, we can be powerful in the pursuit of the implementation of indigenous people's rights. We are a grassroots organization working on indigenous people's rights and connecting local issues to the international level, such as, such as the United Nations Permanent Forum on, on Indigenous Issues. As connected by the Pacific Ocean, what impacts on Hawaii today will not only impact on Hawaii, but also in Taiwan, Fiji, Guam, Samoa, Papua New Guinea, and Solomon Islands, basically every island in the Pacific. So today, we're here not only to support our ohana, or mahakaka in my language, in, in Hawaii, but also to defend our common future. We indigenous peoples hold a sacred and inevitable relation with our land and natural resources. When collecting food with, uh, in a wild with my grand uncle, my vuvu, he always reminds us that we borrow the present from the future, from the future generations. So make sure you're using these resources wisely. I believe this is what people call sustainability today. Despite the knowledge we hold for the nature, the legacy of colonial history, land loss, deprivation of sovereignty, and exploitation of natural resources have led indigenous peoples in a vulnerable position when facing the climate change. The extreme weather not only destroyed the ancestral land, the ancestral homeland, but also damaged our culture, physical and mental health. For the unfortunate welfare happened in Maui, we send our support and stand in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters who have suffered from the devastating disaster and long time deprivation of water resources. With that, we urge the United States to work with indigenous communities in the past disaster construction and avoid disaster capitalism. According to Human Rights Watch, the US is currently the second, large green, second largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. Although the US, the, the US enacted the Inflation Reduction Act and submitted a nationally determined contribution to the you, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in line with Article 4 of Paris Agreement, set an economy-wide target to reducing its net greenhouse gas emission by 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in, 30, sorry, in 2030. However, this target is not sufficient to meet the Paris Agreement's goal. The National, the National Environmental Policy Act declares that it is the continuing policy of the federal government to create and maintain conditions that men and nature can exist in productive harmony for the future generations of Americans. In order to carry out the policy, the federal government should use all practical, sorry, practicable means to preserve important historic, cultural, and natural aspects of our national heritage. It also recognized that each person deserves the right to a healthful environment, and all the policies, regulations, and policy, sorry, and public laws of the United States shall be in consistency with the Act. With that, we conclude this testimony with following recommendation that the United States should one safeguard indigenous peoples' full and effective participation in climate policy making. Two initiate a community-led reconstruction after natural disaster. Three, develop the community-led green energy in, digi sorry, in, in indigenous communities. Four, redress the history wrongs of natural resources deprivation. Five, comply the global review under international environmental law and fulfill its obligations. Six, enhance EPA's role of enforcement and monitoring. Seven, strengthen the role of judicial review on climate change. Thank you for your valuable time and patience. Masaru alabats, mahalo green.
Thank you, Alon. Uh, next up, we have Sophie. And following Sophie, we have Josh Edmondson. Okay. Hi, I'm Sophie Tipler. I'm from Anchorage, Alaska, and a student here at Richardson. Um, I have a past career in civil engineering uh, and worked with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, also known as ANTHC DHE. Very long acronym. Um, and Alaska doesn't have a law school, so we don't have this sort of community. Um, so I just feel like I need to present and um, talk about my experience on Alaska. So yeah, I'm gonna narrow in on some issues, uh, specifically surrounding rural Alaska coastal communities um, for two reasons. Uh, one, I believe it speaks to the general issues of federal agencies' fear of commitment. And two, Alaska as the US's only Arctic state is experiencing the most rapid impacts from climate change. Recently, I spoke to the Denali Commission's program manager of environmentally threatened communities who gave me a poignant analogy, and I'll provide that in a moment, um, regarding the countless interagency meetings and workshops held to discuss relocating and, uh, and decommissioning coastal villages in Alaska. Alaska is home to over 200 rural communities, uh, many of which have fewer than 300 villagers, all of which have hazardous source materials. Some are still, uh, some still have active honey bucket lagoons. Uh, some are actively being swept into the ocean and all are rich in culture and traditions and connected to diverse and abundant subsistence activities and economies that are made possible by pristine habitat and are essential to the health and well-being of the residents. Um, I will now discuss the relocation efforts of the village of New Talk, Alaska, which experiences up to 90 feet of erosion each year due to melting permafrost and loss of sea ice protection. The current erosion line is at, uh, has taken out many homes and is currently at the school, um, and it's less than 500 feet from the landfill, which uh, can, this is how they get to their landfill, you can only access it by boat. Uh, where was I? So yeah, so you're transferring trash by skiffs, and as you can imagine, this is very dangerous um, and energy intensive and in inevitably will lead to pollution. Um, the Denali Commission back in 2017 received the first pot of federal funding for relocation efforts to construct a new village across the river on stable ground called Maktavik. The Commission and other agencies responsible for planning the relocation neglected putting the decommissioning of new talk into the NEPA environmental impact statement. Um, I believe this was a well-intentioned de decision to move the community as soon as possible, but I don't think that this sort of NEPA segmentation should happen again. Uh, when I was an ANTHC DHE engineer, I worked on the Muktavik water, sewer, and landfill projects as some of my first but it wasn't until I was tasked to my own little lead design project that I became simply too uneasy to continue the work. Uh, the ironic task that I was given was to design a fence that went around a new landfill in Shishmaref, uh, which is a climate threatened village off the coast of the Arctic Ocean uh, and is seeking relocation. I, um, yeah, so I opened up my Arctic and permafrost engineering toolbox. I did some calcs to combat frost heave and intense coastal, Arctic coastal wind, drew a boundary around the landfill with room for expansion, assisted in obtaining permits, and then I got on a plane and went to evaluate the site. I was doing my job, tasked by a limited scope funded by the government, and it was a necessary job. Landfills do need fences. But when I got to Shish, I was face to face with uh, an unforgettable reality. The older capped and closed landfill, uh, and that's literally what it is called on the site plan, is a capped and closed landfill. So it's been, yeah, it's, it's done. It's not seeing, it's not being fed any new trash, but now it's being rapidly eaten away by the ocean tides. Um, and also, as you can see, this is the old landfill right here. It's where this photo is taken. And then this is the Honey Bucket Lagoon. Um, so yes, it, the, the ocean is nearing the Honey Bucket Lagoon. 
where the village dumps their excrement inside plastic bags um, without any treatment. Mm. Uh, it's a, they have now water, uh, or they have wastewater systems, but it's, uh, and yeah, it's an old slogan, so it's just been waste sitting there for a while. Anyway, uh, so a few weeks ago, when I spoke to my old coworker and program manager who led the New Talk relocation, he told me that they intentionally ignored the decommissioning of New Talk and the environmental assessment because no agency would take responsibility, even though some said it cannot be ignored. Uh, I left you hanging on his analogy so that you could understand the issue beforehand and it went like this. It's like there's a car accident on the road and everyone is slowing down to get a good look, but no one is getting out to help. Shishmaref and Newtok are two of about 13 communities in Alaska that are facing imminent relocation efforts. However, most require uh, retreat and protection measures. So now that I have informed or reminded you all of uh, the awoken sleeping giant of Alaska. I want to quickly switch gears uh, and highlight what I think needs to change drastically, and that is our current linear economic approach to material production and waste management. EPA themselves states that materials management is associated with an estimated 42% of total U.S. greenhouse gases. If EPA and other agencies focused on uh, funding circular economic waste management strategies, it would change the social norm. And I honestly think the decisions that the, the engineers made to segment new talks decommissioning from the relocation impact statement would not have happened. Uh, waste production is an economy in itself, which thrives off disempowering local waste managers from actually managing waste input. And there is strong opposition from highly profitable global industries, which we have discussed already, such as oil and plastic, as well as food and beverage industries. I think that the US government needs to enforce circular waste economic programs and regulations without the recycling narrative, which is key, um, and turn a chapter. Uh, again, I simply believe that if we have a na as a nation, we're much more focused on waste management, cleaning up our messes, rather than sweeping, sweeping them out to sea, then this agency bystander problem would self-correct with far less friction and far less damage. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sophie. Up next, we have Josh Eddington and then Madison Owens. Madison. Yeah, aloha, my kako. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Joshua Eddington. I'm a second year law school student here at William S. Richardson. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science, and I'm a resident here in Honolulu. But I've been a farmer for the last 20 years, uh, primarily on Maui, in upcountry Maui. So as we've heard today, there's so many problems with climate change, so many impacts from climate change, and so many more solutions that can clearly be done by the federal government. So I just wanted to take a moment to address some of my personal experiences that I've seen as a resident, employee, community member, and as a farmer. So one of the main impacts that I've witnessed is the decrease in average rainfall. Um, I'm from Kula, Maui, so we've had, you know, usually rainfall patterns are these slow, steady showers that we receive from the fall to the spring. And now we're having long, lengthy periods of drought that are followed by extreme storms. In the past few years, we've had water restrictions up country and when it finally rains, it sees intense storms that dump several inches overnight and cause flooding and landslides that wash out culverts, run up onto the roads and destroy homes. All that water ends up going down country, flooding urban areas and ultimately sending runoff into our oceans and onto our reefs. But not only do these storms wreak havoc, they also prevent that much needed moisture from infiltrating and saturating into our soils. As a result, those drought conditions are further exacerbated. And these drought conditions have all kinds of effects and most poignantly, you know, they lead to the increase of fire risk, which we've all witnessed with the fires. Um, as a farmer, the increase in temperature and the drought conditions 
have led to heat stress on a lot of my crops and have resulted in the reduction in crop yields and in propagation success rates. Additionally, these stresses have led to diseases, uh, extreme overnight infestations of insects uh, that have completely wiped out my crops. Um, and like was spoken earlier, you know, these drought conditions also require uh, more water, uh, which is this further amplifying cycle of needing more resources. Um, and there's clearly so many actions that the federal government can take. Um, most importantly, the, the federal government should implement policies to drastically reduce carbon emissions and transition to clean energy sources. Um, the federal government should also prioritize carbon sequestration. Um, I like the analogy um, that the speaker made earlier about we need to fix the leak and also bail the water. And I believe that farms can be a powerful ally in this fight. Uh, to support this, the federal government should provide financial support in the form of subsidies, low interest loans, grants to farmers who adopt climate resilient practices that sequester carbon. Additionally, the federal government should expand conservation programs to incentivize landowners to adopt sustainable land management practices that protect our natural habitats and further the sequestration of carbon. On a local level, the federal government should invest into some of Hawaii's infrastructure projects to enhance climate resilience, including coastal protection, flood management, and again, as we have recently seen, more supporting aid to disaster preparedness and disaster response. Um, I also want to stress and echo uh, the importance and the necessity of the collaboration with Native Hawaiians, local communities, and other Indigenous groups. Uh, their wisdom about sustainable land management and resource management is invaluable and integral to the climate fight. So in closing, EPA and the federal government is not doing enough, um, and there is clearly a lot more that they can be doing. Um, just want to implore them to act with urgency in response to the climate crisis and to take more action. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Is Madison Owens here? Okay. Um, the next up is going to be Joshua Scott and then Brian Petrovsky. Written to read off of them. Um, I'm another layman here. Uh, I heard about this from my aunt who emailed me about it, and I had no idea this was going on. So there's a bit of a messaging issue. I imagine the rest of the campus and all the departments had no idea what's going on. There's a certain lack of uh, broader messaging, I imagine. I for as, uh, as many of you that do care, there's a lot more that simply have other things that they care about. And I don't want to harsh on them for not caring as much because it's a big world and there's so many things to care about. But there's a lot of distractions, so there needs to be a bit more of a, an aggressive push by those that do care, namely the EPA. They can't expect, you know, the individual parties to do their work. What they should do is empower you guys more or perhaps give you a, a more centralized forum to come to and marshal your efforts together. Um, James Hansen, he was, I guess, an ex-NASA scientist, uh, Don here, ex-EPA scientist, maybe bring them back into the fold, give them a stronger voice, um, signal boost them, I'm not sure. The uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, the the Earth Bill that was talked about earlier, that sounds like a really promising idea. Mainly, that's not to disvalue the other ideas that were presented, but that seems to be a good, quick and to the point thing to, to kind of, you know, strike while the iron's hot. That seems to, I don't know. I, I don't remember the points he, he went over, but uh, targeting the factory uh, legislation, My father cared a lot about climate change. Stuart Scott, he's since passed in 2021. I myself was one of those layabouts who didn't care as much. And so in since then I've you know not done much and I feel guilty about that. So hearing about this, I felt I should at least come by and show support and see what what was being done. And 
it's encouraging, but at the same time, there's still a very large amount of despair. And I imagine the other students at this university, they could be reminded how there is hope or shotgun this recording all across the campus to every other lay person, see how many other people you can get involved, encourage them, or otherwise, again, put more power into those who are very well informed, the scientists, those who already have a good idea, the, uh, the carbon sequestration for this organ thing, that seems promising. So thank you all for coming here and keep up the good work and, you know, try to overcome this whole sense of despair that myself and other students might have. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joshua. All right, up next we have Brian Petroski and then Holly Doyle. All right, good afternoon, folks. My name is Brian Petrusky. I'm a second year evening part-time student here at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about research funding. I'm a former biomedical scientist or worked in biomedical science. And you've heard a lot today about, um, in particular, the speaker about the Earth film mentioned a moonshot. And the, for those of you who are unaware, the moonshot is a reference to the space race where, you know, despite the USSR's initial lead, the United States eventually put a man on the moon. And that was a, a great source of national pride. It was a big unifying thing that everyone in the country could feel good about. And I think we need to do something similar in terms of our uh, clean energy funding. And just to give a little number crunching here, I, I went and looked up. The total space race expenditures were 255, 257 billion over 13 years. And that's in 2020 dollars, which roughly comes out to about $19.8 billion per year in terms of um, just Project Apollo itself, which was the project to get a man to the moon. And uh, just this earlier this year, uh, the president announced, or the NSF announced the uh, Energy Earthshots Initiative, which is you know analogous to our space race moonshot. And that was only 264 million with an M dollars over seven research areas. This just boggles my mind. That's, you know, less than 10% of what we spent to put someone on the moon, which didn't even have any um, real practice. I mean, obviously we derived a lot of technology from that effort, but that was just a matter of national pride to defeat the USSR in, in putting someone on the moon, a crazy idea. And we have this giant urgent problem of greenhouse gas emissions, climate change. I'm sorry, I'm getting really emotional right now, but I feel the urgency of this room, you know, like we need to do something more. Um, and just to put this in perspective, you know, we heard about military funding. I looked it up as well. That's $867.7 billion. And this, you know, it's just crazy to me. I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting so emotional, but this really, um, I, I urge our, our government to act with more urgency with, with respect to this clean energy funding. Uh, thank you for uh, <clears throat> thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Up next, we have Holly Doyle, and then our last speaker will be Natalie or Ornelli. Aloha my kako. Um, Brian, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> no, and I will probably cry, so just a heads up. Um, so aloha my kako, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Holly Doyle, and I'm a third year law student at the William S. Richardson School of Law. For the better part of this year, I have worked with our school's Native Hawaiian Rights Clinic to support community members from Maui Kumohana or West Maui as they navigate our state's water use permitting process. Most of these community members are kalo or taro farmers who depend on healthy stream flows to cultivate kalo, which in the Kanaka Maui or Native Hawaiian worldview is our elder sibling. This past summer, I clerked at Earth Justice's Mid-Pacific office where I witnessed Native Hawaiian youth plaintiffs defend their state constitutional right to a life-sustaining climate system. I do not recite this part of my resume to assert expertise. 
I say it to demonstrate that these issues, combating climate change and safeguarding constitutionally recognized traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights are one and the same. I say it to make clear unequivocally that Hawaii's climate change experts are our Kalo farmers and our keiki. I say it to ask the EPA specifically and the United States generally not to not only center, but to follow indigenous leaders in Hawaii and on the continent in crafting climate change solutions. There is not enough time to discuss the Kanaka Maui precepts underpinning our constitutional provisions, statutes, and judicial decisions that articulate and affirm the state's public trust duty to Aloha Aina, not even if my testimony lasted an entire semester, and I know that we are all grateful it will not. So suffice it to say that Article 11, Section 1 of our state constitution requires the state to conserve and protect our natural resources for the benefit of present and future generations. Article 11, Section 7 articulates the state's obligation to protect, control, and regulate Hawaii's water resources for the benefit of the people. And Article 11, Section 9 provides that every person possesses a constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. By failing to take meaningful climate action, the United States hamstrings Hawaii's efforts to fulfill these constitutional obligations. By failing to take meaningful climate action, the United States fuels the escalating water conflict in Lahaina and elsewhere in Maui Kumohana as legacy diverters, successors to sugar plantation interests, maintain their stranglehold on the public's water resources. By failing to take meaningful climate action, the United States steals our children's futures, especially those who would be Kala farmers if only our streams flowed as they were meant to. 50 years ago, William S. Richardson, a former Chief Justice of our state Supreme Court, founded our law school, intending it to be a place where future lawyers and decision makers were trained to think about the little guy, the little guy downstream. I'm here to ask the United States to do the same. Surviving climate disaster means making difficult decisions to deprioritize corporate interests that look at our aina and see profit where we see kin. I believe we can all learn to see the world differently. E ho'i kanani moku ula ai ole kawai. Mahalo. Thank you, Holly. Up next, we have Natalie Ornelli, and she will be our last speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Ornell Hotaki, and I have a message. I'm not an expert on climate change, but I made some observations in the past couple of years with regards to climate change and foreign policy. That interested in me in particular because of my background. I'm Afghan, European American. Half my family is from Afghanistan, the other half is European. I'm from Boston. And so uh, maybe the climate change experts can, can weigh in. I really enjoyed this talk. I learned so much from everyone, especially someone mentioned these sand batteries and you know sustainable solutions. So as everyone knows, at the end of August in 2021, the United States made a withdrawal from Afghanistan that didn't have such a great impact, so girls haven't been able to go to school. Uh, things are a disaster, if you put it in a you know, frank manner. So in the last couple, it was probably a year ago when I was reading CNN headlines, and I saw an article by Julia Horowitz, who's a senior contributor for CNN, that said that Afghanistan has trillions of, this was the headline, just quoting the headline, it said Afghanistan has trillions of dollars of minerals that could save the world from climate change. And so that highlight, you know, struck me because I was in a place of pain seeing all my Afghan sisters, me living this privileged life here in the, in the West in Boston, not being able to go to school. And I read these headlines with regards to Afghanistan and climate change and Afghanistan having a trove of, of minerals. At the same time, we're, we're learning about, you know, sustainable development, mineral, you know, mining minerals isn't always the best solution and all that. But I also, you know, I did some more research. I saw an article from Reuters saying that the United States is in a, a place of, uh, what was the phrase? Something about security risk, national risk, the demand for lithium batteries is really at a high by 2030. We could be facing a lot of issues with lack of supply to lithium batteries. So while these other newer inventions are coming out, I'm not sure how quickly those inventions are gonna come out or what kind of drawbacks or how kind of mass impact they can have. 
But, you know, with a little more research beyond that CNN article, I also saw another report that just came out from Foreign Policy magazine about China being in Afghanistan making billion dollar deals in the past couple of months. But what made me happy about that, because China hasn't always made everything perfect in Afghanistan, with, you know, they were mining um, as I know, was an architecture underground Buddhist city in Afghanistan, there was some drawbacks to that. But uh, what made me happy is in this most recent research paper I saw is that China was making a commitment to sustainable mining in Afghanistan. And so they were saying that we can promote girls' education and rights in Afghanistan with these mining projects. We can also preserve, you know, make sure that we don't destroy the Buddhist history of Afghanistan, which is important. That struck me. Um, as you know, right now, with our foreign policy relations with China, Afghanistan aren't in the best place right now. So the, the shake, there's, a, I would say, a shaky relationship that we have with China right now and Afghanistan following the withdrawal. But I think what the United States can do, knowing that we also have vested interest in lithium and all the other minerals that are in Afghanistan, because this is really a treasure trove of minerals um, that could be accessed in a way that's not destructive to the country, which has already been destroyed for so many decades. It's hard to even imagine it could be destroyed anymore. But um, I think what we can do is, from a foreign policy perspective is to encourage China to continue doing this sustainably and to make a deal. It could almost be an international deal where we could go to you know, a big UN summit around climate change, Afghanistan, girls' education, and to guarantee girls' educational rights with the Taliban, um, you know, having them see the benefits of guaranteeing girls' rights and steering away from their radical interpretation of Islam as negatively impacting the entire economy of Afghanistan, and creating international security risks, and how we could all tie this together with climate change. So I haven't formulated my whole ideas around this, but there's something here. And um, if you study China's history, you know the great expression, women hold up half the sky. So um, we want to make sure that China's not just taking all the minerals and not staying true to its promise to encourage girls' educational rights in Afghanistan. Um, what is it going to do with all those minerals? I'm not sure, but these deals are just happening right now. They're billion dollar deals in Afghanistan. Afghanistan does have the largest lithium deposits in the world, along with many other minerals that could be key to solving the climate change crisis. Uh, I'm also excited for the sustainable other developments like sand batteries, all these other great things that we learned about. But that's my spiel. And uh, maybe the geniuses of the United Nations who haven't failed in Afghanistan can, can make a new deal or something around this. So please pay attention to that because Joe Biden doesn't want to talk about Afghanistan. And uh, it's a big political point for his reelection too. So. It's all very interesting. Thank you. All right, everyone, that would conclude uh, the testimony. Um, we just want to thank everyone for coming out. And if you're online, thank you so much for sticking around. We will have Poo-poo's outside, Professor Wallace Brown, would you like to say a couple words before we head out there? I would, thank you. Uh, I'm tasked, well, we'll start, uh, we rewind a little bit. If I followed my plan earlier, I didn't actually introduce myself, and if that was intentional, uh, I wanted to make sure the focus was on the folks who, who showed up to testify today. Uh, but I should introduce myself before we all leave. My name is Richard Wallace I'm one of the co-directors of the Environmental Law Program here. Um, and, and this task I've been given of wrapping up and summarizing is impossible. Perhaps even more impossible than the task that you were all given to testify on climate action in five minutes. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. I, I want to share just three things before we all go and enjoy some food and drink and, and fellowship together. Uh, the first thing I'd like to share is gratitude. Gratitude for anybody who had the stamina, stamina to sit through three and a half hours on this. Um, I, I've never been involved in an event before that involves something like 30 speakers. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a lot. And if you're here, I thank you. I have gratitude for the 30 speakers because we heard an incredible diversity of perspectives, of ideas, of solutions, um, and of clarity on the problem that we're attacking. So thank you to all of you who spent the time to do that. Um, thank you to our hearing officers. Here's a, uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh, a little bit of behind the scenes for you. They're not just hearing officers. Uh, Holly and Malia, it's not Holly. <laughs> Oh, he's back there. <laughs> Mehana and Malia also were the core organizers of this event and have been working day and night uh, for weeks, and in fact, to pull it all off. So thank you very much to both of you for coming.
And of course, thank you to, to our, our partners at the Sierra Club of Hawaii and the CPR initiative. So the thank yous are easy because you're all wonderful people. The harder part is to try and to make to so to, to make make sense of all of what we've heard. Um, I didn't testify today. I cheated. I get the benefit of all of your wisdom in submitting written testimony. So I'd like to remind you, uh, as is clear up here on the screen now, that you have a week if you'd like to get more on the record. Two weeks now. Two weeks. Oh, you've been given an extension. Yeah, yeah. We, we we're doing till October 13th. October 13th. So if there's more that you'd like to say, or more you'd like others to hear, uh, please get that written testimony to, into the record through the CPR initiative. I'll be doing that because I feel inspired by the words we heard today. Uh, my cheating has left me with, with sort of two uh, divergent feelings. We heard a lot of sobering news today, sobering news about the physical reality of climate change and what causes it, but equally sobering news about the conflict that the climate harms are creating in our community, community's fabrics, everywhere, here in Hawaii, on every island, but around the globe. Um, and what do we do? I, I think, Josh, you know, you were, you were dealing with that as you were speaking. What do we do with some of that sobering news that we've heard? Here's my plan for my written testimony, is I'm going to do the, the legal jujitsu move and see if I can turn some of that sobering news into inspiration. Because I'm just as, in, just as I'm sobered by the, the, you know, the, the tearing of our community's fabric, I'm inspired by the tapestry of solutions we've heard. We've heard about solutions at the local level, at the grassroots level. We've heard about solutions at our state level. We've heard about solutions at the national level. We've heard about solutions at the Pacific regional level. And we've heard about solutions at the federal, at the, uh, on the global level. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't in good conscience think about my testimony without thinking about how I can amplify the, the voices and the solutions we've heard. And that's my plan. I hope that you'll join me. The last thing to say in terms of inspiration is I think we should recognize that we have two EPA Region 9 staffers here with us for the full duration of the event. Thank you. Yeah. That, that made me realize that I actually am also inspired and I have gratitude for those uh, at the, you know, those regulators, those agency staffers who are turning the tide of federal inaction. Uh, and I think that uh, with the information we've heard today, that we, we can count on more of that from our insiders in the federal government, the state government, global governance regimes. Uh, uh, I am actually very hopeful that the sentiment shared today will turn uh, into real action in the future. But before that happens, we should eat and drink together. So thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. Yeah, thank you.